Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Q&A stream, where we just answer questions. So, gonna answer a bunch of questions, go ahead and put them in, and we will get started. All right, right away with the first question. Let's just jump right in and keep going. All right. Hello, Mort. I'm developing myself as a project engineer, and I was informed that Riot works with what is called delivery as project management. How delivery is applied in TFT and who leads that area? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting because as far as companies go, you know, I always talked about how Nintendo was a design centric company. Um, Microsoft was an engineering centric company. Uh, Riot is a project management centric company. Uh, a lot of the product managers and delivery managers are actually the people that sort of run the studio, if you will, and sort of have the most uh, swing. And so delivery management is a subsection of product management that's basically in charge of sort of making sure the project is going the way it needs to be going. It's hitting the delivery milestone it needs to, things like that. So they often work with the engineers, artists, designers to make sure deliveries are being hit uh, when they are, things like that. Uh, and it's interesting because they have a lot of potential. For example, if you look at uh, uh, Jeremy Lee, who's the current executive producer of League of Legends, he started off as a delivery manager as well. Um, Brian is our head of delivery. Um, he's a really awesome guy, does way more work than he should need to. Um, so, like I said, it's definitely an area with a lot of potential. Um, if you like organizing teams and organizing projects and things like that. So, yeah, there you go. All right. And mods, please feel free to clear out any questions that you think are not uh, worth answering. Cool. Hey Mort, with both Flex 3 cost AP carries, Vex and Lulu being utility focused, and Lux being very situational, AP items like Decap, Spark, Archangel, and more feel bad to slam, especially with no AP 5 cost item holder with Ziggs being on the weak side right now and Sona utilizing mostly attack speed. Do you think making Lulu especially a stronger carry and Lux a little more flexible will solve the current rods and cloaks being terrible argument? Um, yes and no. I think that helps. Don't get me wrong. Um, this is one of the reasons why I've been on my, my anti-support champions, anti-binge champions, uh, is that support champions end up in this role where they never want items. And so that means the items that are designed for those champions aren't used, right? Like if Lux wanted death cap and Lux was a good, like if you found a one star Lux with a death cap, you should be like, sweet, I can get through the mid game. Um, but that's not true right now because Lux only succeeds when she's three starred and when she has EDM. And this is a tricky challenge because AP champions especially, uh, they, they scale with star level in such a way that you like you need that burst, right? AP has this weird synergy where let's say I cast a spell and it does 54% of your health, okay? That may as well be the same as you doing 95% of your health because it means I need two casts to kill you. We had this problem with Yumi where it was like if Yumi could one-shot you, she was broken, and if she had to two-spell you, she was garbage. Um, so it's a really interesting challenge. It's why mana items are so highly desired. The other tricky part here is that... Uh, a lot of the traits right now, like Spellweaver, already give a bunch of AP, so getting more AP isn't usually what you want. You usually want crit, you usually want multiplier damage, things like that. So, in a way, you've almost described two separate problems. You've described what we need to do to, like, Lux and Lulu and things like that, but also, I think Death Cap and Archangels and things like that also need some love. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Death Cap got that percent damage amp, I think it just doesn't have enough of it, so I think that's that's kind of a big thing. So hopefully that answers. Cool. Again, if it's at the top of my list, I'm just going to answer it. Mods, it's up to you to filter. Did your opinion on LOL change after joining Riot? Um, yeah, to some extent. So I played League. 
how long? So I've been at Riot seven and a half years. So I guess I've been playing. I've been playing League since set one, and I had, you know, played since season six. And I definitely got more into LOL once I was there. But what I will also say, it's a bit of you know how the, uh, you know how the cookies are made, if you will, or what's the the secret behind the recipe. But the challenge here is that. Like, you see a lot of what's going on, and it's, like, it, it's less mystical, right? This is true of all game dev. It's, like, wow, the people who make this game must be geniuses, or they must have their shit together. And it's, like, no, they're just dudes trying to make a game, or people trying to make a game, you know? So, it it's, you know, so your opinion changes. Right? It's, like, that's why they say never meet your heroes, because your heroes are just people, sometimes with their own flaws, their own issues, and things like that. So... Did my opinion change? Yeah, I wouldn't say it got worse or better, but what I'll also say is it feels like Riot still has this like, they want to do a million things and they can't quite pick which ones they need to do sometimes. So, you know, and I don't know. Hopefully that answers your question, but. All right, copy, paste. Can you provide more color on the set design process? I know you said you'd like to provide designers liberty to experiment, and sometimes ideas you don't like turn out well, but when there are things like Cassante from set 9 that you aren't happy with, do those mechanics get blacklisted, or what is the team's takeaway guideline regarding things like that going forward? Thank you again for the team. Been loving the hard work. Yeah. So basically, again, my role on the team is sort of like the mechanic, the finisher, the, the person who knows the, the details, but as a lead... I often, sometimes on the air, I err on the side of too generous, but I want the creative people on the team to feel like they can be creative and they can push the boundaries um, so that they might try something weird. An example of this is like, you know, the first time Giovanni was like, I'm going to make a champion that runs off the board and does sit-ups. My first reaction, because I'm a conservative designer, is like, what? That sounds terrible. That's, that's awful. No, no way. But by letting it go and I'm like let's let's see how it goes let's try it out let's see if we can make this work we get one of our best four costs or five costs of all time which was set four set who would run off and do sit-ups and power up and it was great so you have to provide designers that liberty to experiment and the other thing is that nobody wants to work for a boss who's a know-it-all um you know you have you know I've got at this point almost five years of TFT knowledge and and understanding but you still, you kind of want to take that scientific approach where it's like, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we didn't approach it the right way. Um, one of the things at Nintendo that always bothered me was like, we tried it once eight years ago, therefore it will never work. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe the way we tried it just wasn't quite right. So, you know, you want to take different stabs. Assassins are a good example of this, right? Like, Yes, we've never been able to find the right version of Assassins, but that doesn't mean there isn't a version of Assassins that could exist. You don't just give up. And so we try to find ways to make that work and find, like, we learn different things about Assassins so that we can understand more, uh, you know, about the concept. And that's a thing. Game design for a live service game like this has always been about knowledge acquisition so we can make it even better, right? And there are things that we thought were good a year ago that just aren't good anymore. This is how I finally learned, like, support champions weren't good. Um, so to go to, to your specific thing, when there are things like Cassante from Set 9... So Cassante from Set 9, for example, uh, that's a champion where, like, I personally don't enjoy it, but there are people who do. And so it's a question of, like, well, let's learn... How many players are frustrated by it? How many players enjoy it? Things like that. Um, the other thing I'll say we'd learn about Cassante versus someone like Lee Sin is that Cassante had tank traits, which caused him to work with our mana generation system to a point where he would cast almost infinitely. Uh, and so that was the thing. So it's like, hey, if we're going to make more of these one-shot champions, they probably need to not have tank traits. That's a good learning. That's a good learning to have in your back pocket. So... It's a lot of stuff like that. And then we basically filter in that knowledge uh, that becomes, you know, knowledge that we have for future set development. So, yeah. All right. Continuing on. 
Uh, short form of the question. As a lead for the team, how do you go about conflicts in design? Background for question. Watching your streams and videos, I feel like you've got such an excellent grasp of all design aspects, which feels unreal considering the size of the game. I know it isn't just you designing everything, so when you have a contrasting opinion to one of the designs, how do you go about settling that with the team considering you'd be the final say? Yeah. So generally, uh, basically every small project, every project, any size, has a lead of the project. Um, this is not like some promotion title position or anything like that. This is like, hey, you're, you're responsible for this project, right? So for example, when we did the items rework with all the new items in set nine, Tim is the lead of that project. And whoever is the lead of that project has the final say, uh, you know. But we also train people that when you're the lead, that doesn't mean you just decide everything because that's just a bad approach. That's not really how you want to think about things. Um, you should use all the resources available to you to make the best decisions possible. And so if you're, let's say you're the lead of set eight and you're making Ox Force and you're the lead and you've got Mort, who is this person above you who's advising you that maybe you shouldn't ship Ox Force, it is up to you to use that resource and go, wow, if someone like Mort is saying I shouldn't do it, maybe I shouldn't. Or it's up to you to go, yeah, Mort is saying this, but he's also conservative and I really want to push the envelope, so I'm going to do this. Um, and you get to make that choice as the lead, right? We empower everyone on the team to make these sort of decisions, these tougher challenges, uh, because that's how they grow. That's how they become better designers, better leaders, things like that. Uh, only, but at the same time, what I will say is it is my job to make sure the game is as good as possible. And so sometimes I do have to step in and say, look, I understand what you're doing here, but no, I forbid you. But you can't do that all the time, you know? So you have to, you have to find that line where it's like, nope, I, I'm going to let you try this thing versus no, you're absolutely not going to do that. It's, it's tough. So... And that's, that's the balance. I've gotten it wrong too, right? There are, we spent way too long on a mechanic for set eight that we didn't end up shipping because I let the team experiment um, when I should have probably shot it down four months earlier. Uh, and so that's, that's the challenge of leadership is figuring out when that line is and how much agency to give people to try weird things. So there's no easy answer. This may be a good question. I don't know. What's your advice for someone who is new into their career, but feels like they're stuck in their position and can't move up into a better, better position? How would you go about that? Okay, I'm going to give you my answer, but I want to put a big old asterisk on this. A big old asterisk on this, which is what worked for me does not necessarily work for everybody, and I do not necessarily recommend this for everybody. It's up to you to figure out where your line is. That being said... Uh, I have never asked for a promotion in my life, um, but my the way my path to success has been a combination of patience and insane work ethic. Um, I, for example, have usually never been worried about my job because I'm so necessary at any point because of how much effort I put in. And so the way I moved up was became more necessary, became very good at my job. Um, and so a lot of that is like like work ethic. And the reason I, I like work ethic personally is like, yeah, if you work like 60 or 70 hours a week and you're working really hard or whatever, and then something comes up, like let's say, you know, your kid's got a, a baseball game you need to go to and you go to your boss and you're like, hey, I need time to go do this. Usually they're like, cool, go go and when you come back you're going to keep being awesome and so I don't know I have this weird symbiotic relationship with my employers where like I work really hard for them and then when I need things they give it to me and it's and I keep working hard for them and it's great uh, and so I've found that to be fairly successful but that's not for everybody right not everybody wants to put that much effort into their job for some people a job is a job they have a healthy work-life balance and that's okay so the other aspect I'll tell you here is that, uh, you know, when you say you're stuck in your position, part of this is patience. Um, not everyone 
you know, like people want promotions very quickly nowadays, I've noticed. They're like, cool, I just got promoted. What do I need to do to get to the next promotion? And it's like, chill, maybe wait three years. Um, so patience is sometimes a lot of it. You know, a lot of the people that have been in high up and keep in mind, this is what it's also, it's not every company's fair out there, right? Like I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with two companies I would say are relatively fair, not perfectly fair, but relatively. But I've also heard horror stories about like, yep, I, they hired this guy fresh off the street he's an idiot and he got promoted over me and like, yeah, and that sucks. And that's where you kind of want to try to find a company that you can trust and work for a company that you can believe in. Hey Mort, is there anything you would like to do with TFT that you haven't had the chance to from a technical budget point of view? Yeah, I'll give you one clear answer here. Um, right now, we memory limits, memory budgets are always our big thing. Um, you know, we can barely fit in the 59 champions we have with the skins we have and have the game load without going over our memory budgets. Um, I am not convinced that 59 is the right number of champions. I am I think there's a version of TFT out there that has like 70, even 80, and does some weirder things. I would really like to explore what the game looks like with that. Uh, this could be more of the current cost. This could be different costs. This could be weird utility champions. This could be diverging things where it's like, once you have this trait active, these champions are allowed to appear in your shop now. Stuff like that. That we just can't. We just can't do that because we don't have the memory limits. And that's a thing that I think if we could explore that, I definitely would and would do some really cool stuff with that. But memory limits has been one of our big limitations. So. Hey Mort, I have a question about the current state of open port going on in the game at the moment. What is your opinion about people not playing Sage 2, hoping for a spat on the carousel and move on from there? This doesn't feel right, but in a way understandable. Do you guys see this as a problem? Oh, so this is a really deep question. Um, it's one of those ones that sounds simple when you first talk about it, but as you think about it more, it's a really complicated question. Um, stage 2, I think, is the part of TFT that is the most ripe for improvement, uh, but it's not gonna be an easy answer. And here's what I mean by that. Currently, uh, actually at any given point, right? Stage two is the part of the game where you have the least amount of agency, right? You don't ever press reroll. You just play what the shop gives you. And the reason for this is because you have to build econ. Right? Anytime you press reroll, you're just screwing yourself out of long-term econ. There's just no way. You, you need to build up that long-term econ. So, And if you hit a bunch of pairs, if you, if you hit a bunch of two upgrades, cool, you can win streak. And if you don't, you're going to lose a bunch of health and you're going to die. Let's pretend for a minute we cut loss streaking, right? Let's just say loss streaking is gone. Well, what that means is stage two is now all of a sudden about whoever just got lucky and hit their pairs, right? There's no there's no counterplay, there's no agency. It's like, well, we all need the econ. You happen to hit a bunch of two stars. I didn't. Cool. Guess I lose. Fun. Lost streaking gives you a, a bit of agency. It's like, you get now a decision where it's like, no, no, my board is strong, so I'm gonna try to win streak. Or, nope, my board is weak, so I'm gonna try to lost streak. And I'm gonna try to lost streak and like preserve health. And there's this cool bit of agency that adds skill expression in there. The problem is that's different than open fording. Open fording isn't really skill, right? It's just I sell all my units, I accept the fact that 30 damage is acceptable. Cool. And so we have to find this line where it's like there's lost streak skill expression but open fording is incorrect. And I think we had it there but uh, we lowered the player damage by like one, by like one. But it just goes to show you how one player damage can make a massive difference. Um, the other thing you mentioned is like spatulas. 
spatula value has gone up significantly, right? Um, the difference between having a spatula and not having a spatula right now is, is pretty massive. Now that one is at least easier to fix, because let's be real, spatulas right now are mostly true damage spatulas, which we know that emblem is just too strong, right? Like, you cut the 10% bonus damage on that emblem, it's probably fine. So that's an easy solve. But again, the early game is this tricky part. The early game, we need to figure out a way to add agency and add skill expression without it becoming derivative and a single player health can be the difference between the right way and the wrong way to play it. So that's the big challenge. Um, yeah, so the answer is we don't have a clear answer yet, but that's where we kind of like turn the knob a little bit, right? Plus one player damage might solve it. Minus one player damage might make it all about loss streaking. So, yeah. All right, this is a good question. What was the reasoning behind bringing up an old set mechanic? Was it like you said, TFT's greatest hits? Yes and no. Um, so we knew in set 10 that we were going to have portals still. We were really happy with portals from set nine. We knew we were having augments because augments are great. Um, and then we actually were working on a different set mechanic, still called headliners, but it was not chosen. Uh, it was a different version of headliners and we, we're experimenting with this set mechanic. We were getting it to a decent spot. And then what happened was we got to a point where we needed to make a decision. Let's keep going on, uh, let's keep going on this headliner or we have to start over. And what happened was we got to a point where it was like, I think this version of headliner could work. I can't tell you what it is because we may use it sometime in the future um, because it could work. But the time to make it would be so much time, we would have to, like, burn ourselves out. So, um, sorry, people are saying volume is low. I, I, I can't really turn myself up. Um, the, the problem was we weren't going to be able to uh, fix the, the mechanic in time. So, we had a few months left. It was one of those okay, how are we going to do this? And it was like, well, the good news is Chosen is very similar to... Uh, Chosen is very similar to this headliner mechanic. So let's pivot to headliners. And then that kind of set us up to this point where set 10 had portals and... Uh, it had portals, it had augments, and it had Chosen. So then it felt like a greatest hits. And that's why we went with it. And then that's why we spent a little bit of time trying to improve it so it wasn't just chosen. That's why we did the whole every shop, higher higher odds, things like that. So, yeah. But that was why. Where do you see set 20 of TFT? By the way, mods, I don't know if you're filtering any of these. I hope you are. Otherwise, I'm going to be doomed. Um, where do you see set 20 of TFT? I think the big thing for TFT is going to be that we can't just keep doing the same set over and over, right? Like we know how to make sets, but we can't just keep doing that. Um, we're going to have to find, you know, that, that little plus one that makes the game better. Um, this could be things like augments and portals. This could be something else. But I think the challenge for set 20 is if it's just more of the same, people are going to get bored. So we've got to figure out what that more is. Obviously, I can't talk about what those are, but that's going to be the challenge. And the challenge is doing that without making the game more complex. Because as I have said before, we're kind of at our complexity ceiling. So we've got to figure out ways to innovate in the space without adding complexity, which is tough. Which is tough. That, that, I think, is the next big challenge of the next five years of TFT. So, all right. Hey, Mort. Just curious about innovation. It seems that every set is growing the game so much. And with the TFT team being so large now, do you feel like innovating new sets will be challenging in the near future? <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the same question. Um, but yes, yes. I think... 
bringing back new sets only helps a little bit. Uh, old sets is a temporary thing that players will enjoy for a month, maybe, but you still have to innovate in the space. Um, I don't think there's any game that's been around for 10 plus years that's just the same old, same old. Someone in chat just said, Smash Brothers has been the same for decades and people aren't bored. That is a terrible example. And the reason that is a terrible example is because yes, people are bored. As much as I, I'm a huge Smash Brothers fan, so let me be very clear on this. How many people are actually still playing Smash Brothers? The answer is not a lot. Someone just said, what about chess? Same thing. Yes, they exist, but not to the level that TFT is, right? Like TFT has X million players, a number I can't say. Smash Brothers does not have X million players playing right now. They have much less than that. Don't get me wrong, Smash is great. I love Smash, but TFT aspires to be this game that you can constantly play hundreds of hours and not stop playing, you know? And, like, that's the challenge. And one way to overcome that is, you know, new innovation, things like that. It's it's a live service game. That's that's the challenge. So we're not, we're not looking to just be chess because chess is a game that people play for a bit, then they stop playing. So... Nah, Dino, just run ads. People are going to miss stuff. It's fine. So. We, we, can't, we can't stop it. All right. Uh, when looking at balance and design, is it important to set out a minimum number of tuning levers for champions? Would it be approached differently for champions filling different roles? Yeah. So the problem is, when you, whenever you're making a balance lever, the question is, it's like, you have to ask yourself immediately, what if this is too strong? What if this is too weak? What if we need to fix it? And so you need to have levers in place to make sure that you can solve that problem. Let's pick a random champion here, Tarek. Tarek the one cost, okay? Now, let's say Tarek ends up being too strong. On what axis? Is he tanking too much? Is he doing too much damage? Uh, what is he doing too much of? right what you don't let's say let's say we didn't put in a balance lever for the damage um you know what are we gonna do um we have to like all of a sudden if he's not doing enough damage that means we're sort of stuck as is um and you don't want to be in that situation because then that means you have to implement a uh you know a bunch of new things you have to add new text stuff like that i gotta stop reading chat chat's distracting me um but yeah, so basically when we're when we're making the champions, we need to make sure all the balance levers are there so that if something goes wrong, we can adjust it. Um, and then it's on every axis, right? So a damage dealer, it might be they're stunning too long. It might be their damage is not spread out enough. And so any of those levers you can add, but the more levers you add, the more complex the spell is. So you have to do it in like the most simple and elegant amount possible. And that's the tricky part. Okay. Uh, what would your advice be for someone who is trying to climb in TFT ranked? Is there a specific thing you feel like most players get stuck with and that's why they struggle to climb? I feel like I have hit a plateau in high gold each set at around 100 games. Yeah, so I'm going to give you some not popular advice here. because here. But here's my honest advice. When you're trying to learn a game and get better at it, a lot of people look at the ranked ladder as instant gratification of a number going up, right? It's like, the way I learn the game is if my ranked number went up, then I'm learning the game. The problem is the way to climb a ranked ladder is not the same as learning the game. There are methods to climb a ladder that are really good that are not going to teach you the game, right? This could be forcing an OP comp, this could be copying a particular play style um, that will give you short-term gains, but not long-term understanding of the game. And so what I think you have to do is actually ignore the ranked number. Just put it aside and just go like, it exists, it, it's there, but that's not your primary motivation. Your primary motivation should be learn the game, like figure out things that are going on. So my advice is, like I said, ignore that number. Unless you're like, this advice changes if you're Grandmaster and you're trying to be competitive, but unless you are literally in that level, stop worrying about your ranked. 
The difference between gold and platinum, not that difference. So just, just play the game, learn the game, figure out things you like about it, figure out things you don't, understand the different champions and the items. And as you learn that, you'll find that you're learning more about the game as you keep playing. And that's important thing. Because if you focus too much on the rank, you get in your own head. So you got to stay out of your own head. You've got to just like play the game. So yeah, that's my advice. Morning, Mort. Uh, now that we have some time to evaluate the state of Heartsteel, how do you think it compares to more fan favorites like Fortune as an econ trait? Okay, so I'm going to give you my personal opinion first, then my designer opinion. My personal opinion is I love Heartsteel. Heartsteel is like everything I wanted in an econ trait. There's like small ways to play it where you play like three Heartsteel and gain some small economy. You can play it as a vertical and start like benefiting from the rewards, right? You're playing this seven piece trait that gives you no combat power, but you get fun rewards. It's got some really fun outputs like the triple locket dummy, things like that. Uh, I, I am a huge fan of Heartsteel. I think it is the quintessential and like you don't have to hit it on two one because that was the thing I always hated about the old econ traits was if you didn't hit it on two one, you basically couldn't play it. Now for the designer though, I think it's too big brain. Um, I think there are a lot of players that liked the simplicity of something like Fortune, where it was just like, get Fortune, lose, get good rewards. Uh, Heartsteel is a little bit too big brain and is not accessible enough. So a lot of our casual players do not enjoy Heartsteel as much, which is unfortunate because again, as a player, I love that stuff. But as a designer, it just, it hasn't been quite hitting the mark. Uh, I also think it's, it's too, like, one of the best things about Fortune that we screwed up with things like Shimmer Scale and Lagoon and stuff like that was that you get one big payout. It's, like, one really satisfying, like, okay, I, I lost 10 times. Here's 80 gold worth of stuff. Whee! It's so, so fun. It's so great. Uh, whereas Heart Steel to get those really big payouts, is hard. It's, like, you have to be in the late game. You have to, uh, you know, be playing seven. So it just doesn't quite offer that same level of, like, satisfaction that things like Fortune did. So, and I think we have, if, like, for it to be a fan favorite for the wider player base, that's what we have to solve. And I think some of that is coming in that 14.1 change. But I will say I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of how it is, so... All right. Hey, Moritz, since you are a fan of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, are you playing Project L at Riot Games? Uh, I'm not playing it currently because I don't really have the time. Um, plus, the other thing is that I've personally not... Like, I'm not their audience anymore. I played Marvel vs. Capcom very casually in the sense that, like, I never played competitive fighting game like that. I would, but I, like, I had a Dreamcast, and I would, you know, went through and unlocked every character, and unlocked all the costumes and stuff like that. Like, I just liked playing arcade mode over and over and over. That was the kind of fighting game fan I was. Um, I don't think that's the main appeal of Project L, from what I can tell. Um, will I play it on release? Probably a little. But that's the other thing with fighting games, is, like, fighting games in the age of the modern internet have become so solved that like you instantly just know that you don't have the APM to keep up. So I don't know. Will I, will I play it a little? Probably not a lot. That's why I like, that's why I like uh, Smash Brothers so much. Smash Brothers to me was a fighting game that actually was more big brained and I could play it more. That's why I don't like melee as much, but yeah. Skill issue. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit. All right. Hey Mort, uh, how do Zed's shadows interact with his crit chance and spell crit lack thereof? It seems like his shadows can crit without spell crit, but it can be hard to tell due to visual clutter. Thank you. Yeah, this is one where uh, this is sometimes when we implement things, the people implementing it don't remember all the game rules, so we end up with inconsistencies. The reality is, the way it's supposed to work is Zed's shadows 
arc, uh, his spell, and in order for his spell to crit, you must have IE, JG, etc., etc. However, my guess is the way it was implemented is that they're just characters, and because characters can uh, their auto attacks can crit by default, they probably can crit. Um, so this is actually something I would call a bug, but currently I believe you are right that it can crit. So it's challenging because our systems aren't built in a way where everything, like you can't just write a design rule of like spells can't crit. It's like a lot of understanding what's tagged as what within our systems when you're writing that code. So yeah. Does the TFT team also contribute with Runeterra world building? I'd love to see Chonk's lore. No, uh, the TFT team is not the team that's going to be writing stories, writing lore, anything like that. Um, the TFT team is much more gameplay focused and visual focused and things like that. I think there are better people at Riot who do this world building. There are teams you know, that work on Arcane, that work on Legend of Runeterra, stuff like that, that are better at that. Even like the teams making a new champion I, I think are just much better at that. So it's not really an area that we're looking to flex our muscle. So we'd rather focus on keeping the game fun. So, yeah. Hey, Mort, I think a cool thing with Treasure Realms would be a charity donation competition. Maybe have two to three different charities that have a selected new chibi attached and the most donated charity wins and that chibi becomes available. Is something like this ever possible? Uh, so I'm not the right person to ask this question. Um, stuff like this sounds cool on paper, right? Like, let's just do a thing for charity. But I know there's a lot of, like, legal and organization and stuff like that behind the scenes that makes these a lot harder. Um, every time we do it, it's, it's complicated. Um, I'm not fully caught up on what all those complications are. Thankfully, that's not something I have to worry about. But I know the few times Riot has done it, it's a big headache. It's a lot of work to get these set up, to work with the charities, to make sure the paper trails are there, to make sure everything's going to the right spot. Uh, so it's very important. Um, and it's a lot more work than it sounds than just like do a charity, uh, especially for a big company like Riot. For me, it's easy, right? Like we do a charity stream, the money goes, whatever. But then you end up with like all these like charity scams and you got to make sure you're never involved in anything like that. And so there's, there's just a bunch of work that again, I'm not really an expert at, so. But it's a fun idea. It's definitely a fun idea. Hey Mort, I played the new Heart Steel changes on PBE and feel a bit disheartened because I feel like it changes Heart Steel to just like every past econ trait when it was intentionally supposed to be different at the start of the patch. I was wondering if you could talk about your opinions on the changes and how you guys will be monitoring the trait moving forward so it doesn't end up like tilt over. Okay, so I mean, it's fine that you feel this way and you're allowed to feel this way. As the person who literally came up with the design, let me tell you my reasoning. First off, you said, uh, I feel like the change is it to just like every past econ trait. Well, first off, it doesn't change core heart steel. You can play core heart steel the exact same way. Nothing changed. Right? So, like, if you like Heart Steel right now, it's still there. Every four turns, you press Cash Out, you're done. It's Heart Steel. Nothing changed. So, saying it's like it's just going to change, that's just wrong, right? Like, nothing changed about the trait. All we added was this thing that says, you know, keep going. And my goal from a balance standpoint is that will never be optimal. Uh, it will be something that's there for the people that really want to push the luck. And I imagine in a lot of gold and platinum lobbies, when someone pulls it off, will be crazy and exciting. It'll be amazing. But most of the time, players are not going to do it. The numbers you're playing with, by the way, not tuned. Um, my guess is we're going to have to punish you even harder than the 40% right now. Um... But it's, it's there to be like an exciting extra step for the people that want to chase that content. It's never going to be optimal, in my opinion. And I think that's the tuning we need to. And yes, you will have a game where someone gets to that, hits press their luck, eight lost streaks, 
and then has a big cash out. That, that's intended, but those will be rare. Those will be very rare. Um, so, I don't know. I'm happy with the design because, again, you can play it as Heartsteel the way it is, just like on live. And if you want to go crazy, you can, but likely it's going to backfire. So, I don't know. And we'll keep an eye on it. Those numbers are definitely going to be uh, tight. I know a lot of Challenger players right now think Core Heart Steel needs nerfs. So, hmm. all right, I'm 33 minutes behind right now. When it comes to feature lock and delivery, how hard does your team get crunched down? I actually went to school for audio for video games, but certain companies that I did studio tours with really made me question and eventually give up on my dream. And I'm, I'm curious if I found bad planning companies or if that's the standard. Ah, this is a really interesting question. This is a really, really interesting question. Oh man, I'm trying to think of how to break this down without throwing the entire industry under the bus. Um, the reality is making games is complicated. Making games is very, very complicated. And it takes a special level of organization and understanding and willpower to not bloat and things like that that keep a schedule in check. And even when you keep a schedule in check, it never gets kept in check because people want to do more and they want to make it better. And even when you ship a game, you know, you'll always look at that game and go, we could have done more, we could have done more. Like, there's just no limit. Creating games is an infinitesimal problem that there's always more to do on. So it's not bad planning because I've yet to meet the person that can plan what you're talking about. Like it's just, it's not a, it's not a solvable problem. The world's greatest planners don't get it right. So it's not like bad companies, but that being said, there are different degrees, right? Like there's a little bit of crunch, like, the TFT team is, is notorious for this, right? Where it's like, I'll use set nine as an example. Like we shipped set nine because people like Kent put in a ton of extra effort to make sure things got done. And Kent definitely pushed himself way too hard. Um, you know, and there's artists who are like working really hard to get things in and stuff like that. Um, so in that regard, it's the standard, but Riot never actually said, hey guys, you need to work 12 hours a day, right? doesn't have that level of crunch. But I know people who have worked at companies. I had a buddy who worked on one of the Halo games and they literally for eight months had to work 12 hours a day, six days a week. And it was just like, you must be here. So like I said, I've gotten lucky that I've never had to work at a company that forced crunch, but I've self crunched a lot because you want to make the best game. And so it's not like bad plan. Cause a lot of people, when they're like, oh, I had to crunch, it's planning's fault. Not really. Cause making games is like, it's hard. You could be making a game by yourself. What is crunching? Crunching is working more than eight hours a day, five days a week. It's in, it's in, it's forced overtime. Um, so, and that's why I say like you, this is the kind of industry you really have to like love. Otherwise it's just too much, you know? Um, so but there, it's finding your line. It's finding your line and it's finding where you're willing to put in that extra effort versus where you're not. So it's tough though. It's definitely tough. If you're one of the people that wants to have a healthy work-life balance, this industry is scary. And that's true of almost every company, probably close to every company. And the other thing I'll say is as you move higher and higher up, you'll find even more of that. You'll find even more of that. So it's tough. Uh, Mort Dog, you said repeatedly that the gaming industry is kind of rough right now. What can you recommend a guy trying to make a career as a game designer these days? Yeah, so the industry is very, very rough. Um, but the only advice I can give is generic advice, but it is the truth. Um, I've seen this also from some other game dev streamers, but the, the reality is... You just have to start making a game. You just have to start. Get get in there, find a tool, start making a game, start. Build that muscle. It's just like any other creative uh, outlet. You have to start building the muscle. So get in there, make a card game, make a board game, 
make a PC game. It's never been easier to make games on your own. It's never been easier to make games on your own, but you have to do it. And when you do that, you'll have a portfolio and that portfolio will make you like much more attractive, right? Hiring a brand new game designer is hard if they're just like, yeah, I'm a fan of the game and I like stuff, but it's much easier when you can look at a game they've made and go, oh, that's cool. I see you've got potential and you've got a lot of work ethic and I can train this. So we'll get you, uh, we'll get you in there. So that's really all you can do though, is you just got to start making it. I have somebody who's been messaging me on discord with their progress on their game they've been making. And it's just been fun to watch because they're trying and like clearly there's stuff that they could learn but they're learning by doing it so yeah it, it's hard but like i said start with a simple game the game i always recommend is a smash tv kind of clone or a geometry wars kind of clone those are the games that are like very easy to implement but there's a lot of game design stuff you can do with that that game archetype whether it be like weapon systems feel stuff like that so there you go It's interesting that I'm getting context whiplash. Like one minute we're talking about game design, the next minute we get questions like this. Uh, what is the point of going nine at this point? The chance of getting a five class chosen is 2%. I feel just roll down at eight, getting a decent board and go nine. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. You're not wrong, right? Um, the difference between eight and nine at this point, let's ignore the plus one unit because obviously the plus one unit, but here's the difference at eight, you're basically never going to two-star a five cost unless you get obscenely lucky. You know, if you need a Yorick for your comp or a Sona for your comp, you're probably not getting it at eight. So five costs sh should be much more accessible at nine. Headliners, you're still getting a lot of three cost headliners on eight. So as you roll down, it's going to be much less efficient. And so what that means, like, let's say you really, really want Ari. Uh, you're, not, you're, you're not likely to find Ari at eight you might find her but you might not instead you're probably going to have to play with whatever headliner you find this is why usually people will take things like zach or blitz or whatever just to get through level eight it's like whatever one i hit i'll play it when you go nine that's when that 98 percent is okay now i can kind of like make the board i actually want to make so you find like your RE, you find your Twisted Fate, you know, you, the thing you're actually looking for. The five cost headliner at nine is not meant to be something that you force. It's meant to be something like as you're rolling down on nine, all of a sudden, let's say you see a headliner Lucian. You're like, oh, wait a minute. Should I consider this? Right? Like, and it, by keeping it rare, it allows us to keep those powerful, right? So things like Lucian and Ziggs that now can get buffs because they're rare. Um, Whereas before, if they were something that you could force, we have to keep them weaker. So, I don't know. I'm pretty happy with the difference between 8 and 9 right now. 8 is like, play what you hit and kind of make a board. Go 9, then make the board you actually want to put together. Strengthen your board. Feels good. Ari will be gone when you hit 9. See, that's the kind of mindset that like shows you don't know what you're talking about. I mean that with a little disrespect, to be honest. Because again, like... Two people have RE, therefore they're gone. No, no, that's not how it works. And even if that's true, there's like a billion other things you could play at that point. So, I don't know. And it's clear because the challenger players have figured that out. So, all right. This is kind of a repeat question, but we'll do it. Hey, Mort, I feel like since set six, there wasn't anything massive to affect the game like Augments as an example. Do you think something like this will ever happen in the future of TFT? Uh, so again, I mentioned this earlier, but I think something like Augments is what we need. Um, but it's not really as easy as like, just make another thing as cool as Augments. Let me just put that on the task tracking sheet. Uh, coming up with something that interesting is uh, pretty tough. Especially because if you look at Augments from a design perspective, what are Augments? Augments are basically an infinite amount of content that can tap into any system. Now make something cooler. Uh, you know, like literally any, any set mechanic you can think of now could just be an augment, right? Let's say, let's say we ship set 11 and shows, uh, headliners are gone, right? You could have an augment that said headliners appear in your shop now. 
right? Like, we basically have done this. We have a augment that says here's radiant items. We have augments that were hero augments again. Like, we can just do all this stuff. Augments are a self-encompassing system that apply to everything we've ever done. And you're saying make something even cooler like that? You're right. That'd be great. It's not really that easy. But it does need to happen. So shadow item augment, it's been talked about. It's been talked about. We've talked about like, okay, well, what if shadow items could come back as an augment? Would that be okay? And it's like, probably, to be honest. But, you know. So does it need it in the future? Yeah. Is it easy? <laughs> no. No. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mortdog. I want to ask as a game dev, how do you keep or balance the work and friendship treatment among your core workers? Sorry, my first comment bugged out. Oh, this is a hard one. So I see this a lot. Um, let's say you're in the... You, this is true of any job, actually. It's not even game dev specifically. It's your job, right? You're at your job 40 hours a week or more. The people you work with are someone you spend a lot of time with. And especially for younger people, let's say you're in that 21 to 28 range, if you spend too much time there, your work can become your social circle, right? All the people you work with are your friends. You make, you make friends, they become your social circle. And sometimes that can be healthy, right? I had a, an engineering buddy from Nintendo, Dean. He and I were great friends and we, we were hanging out all the time. Um, played Smash together. It's great. You can make some really good friendships. I've seen people, you shouldn't do this, but I have seen relationships start from working together um, because you just, it's natural. You spend so much time at your job and things like that. But here is where it gets dangerous. And I this, this shocked me a bit the first time it happened to me. Um, when I left Nintendo, a lot of the friends stop being friends because they're not in your circle anymore right like a big part of your social circle is the convenience of working together um so all of a sudden like i didn't have any friends dean and i stayed friends but other than that i'm not really friends with anyone i work at nintendo like even though we worked together for 11 years it's over um, even at Riot, as I started like working with people and I'd, I'd be friends with them and then they'd move to a different project or they'd leave Riot and I never saw them again. And so when your social circle becomes your work, it's, it's dangerous because as you train, so it's like you have to create two separate things. You need to create your friends and you need to create your coworkers and you need to keep that distinct. And it's, it's hard. It's really hard, but yeah, it's just adult life. It's. It's an adult life thing. I, I'm not the guy who's going to have the magic answer for this. Um, especially as somebody who doesn't actually have a ton of friends. I mean, I've got family and I've got coworkers, but like, yeah. So it's tricky. It's a hard one. There's no easy answer. Okay. Continuing on. We're at 42 minutes back. Uh, I always liked Chosen Mechanic and was very happy to see it coming back. On the other hand, I'm terrible at flexible play. I am on my best setting, a strong board, and building on it from the beginning. Due to that, I have had less success with previous iteration of Chosen. Is it me just not being good at the set, or should I wait for the next one, or is there something I could do to improve? Um, I mean, learning how to play flexibly is definitely a way to improve. Uh, I think this set is very good at learning how to transition boards. That being said, excuse me. That being said, I think the biggest challenge right now is that we did want more reroll comps like Annie and Senna to be viable. And right now, a lot of the one and two costs, like if there are champions that need more buffs, it's one and two costs. Because there do need to be, some people do want to like buy their first headliner, play around it. Um, so. I think in 14.1, you can expect some more buffs to things like that. That'll be easier to play. But if you really want to understand TFT, this is a great set to sort of force yourself to like, okay, I'm level six. 
sell my one cost headliner, find a three cost headliner. I'm level eight, sell my three cost headliner, find a four cost headliner and learn. Um, it's a great time to improve. So if you really want to improve long-term TFT skills, this is a great set to try. Okay, this is a weird question that chat could probably answer, but I'll, I'll answer it. Have you thought about introducing a forfeit round command like a slash FR? Have I thought about it? Briefly. Would I ever do it? Not a chance. Not a chance. Uh, I, I just cannot imagine. There are too many times where it would be the correct play to do it. And all it would do is grief the other person, right? Oh, I'm up against the fortune person in the lobby. I'll trade eight health to grief their entire thing. Uh, no, nah, that's... No. Nah. The other thing is, like, I talk about how auto battler should be exactly that. It should be, once the fight starts, the decisions have been made, watch what happens. I don't like the idea of, okay, I'm about to watch the fight start. I see I should forfeit this. Now there's an action I should take. Um... Also, yeah, there's the weird timing thing of, like, are we are we seeing who can type it quicker? Ew. So, yeah, just a bunch of reasons I probably wouldn't do that. I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to do this one. You mentioned many times how the team learn about previous sets, but how is this information recorded so it can be easily reachable for a new member arriving on the TFT team? Ooh, this is a good question. This is an amazing question. If you've ever worked at a company, this is the kind of question that, like, if somebody has the magic answer, man, they would help so much. Um, someone in chat just said documentation. That is the base answer that everyone says it's like hey you should document all this knowledge that you've that you've acquired the problem is i've seen that i've seen i've seen so many companies make these documentations and make things like that and here's what happens when you make all that documentation it gets out of date in about six months no one keeps it up to date and nobody wants to when they start the company read through 80 pages of documentation uh and so every company i've ever seen that make these documents they last about six months. They last about six months. And so then you just wasted a bunch of time making a bunch of documentation. So, you know, you are you ask, how do we tra trade this information? The answer is we haven't. It's been really, really bad. Um, one of the biggest problems on TFT, and I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit here, is when it comes to the gameplay of TFT, I have the most knowledge out of anybody and the challenge is I need to get that knowledge out of my head. We have literally said that one of our, our goals is to take the TFT knowledge out of Mort's head and put it in more of the team. Like that is something we are actively trying to do. And there hasn't been an easy answer. Um, what I've been trying to do is just like every day or two, it's like, here's a lesson. Here's a thing you should be aware of. Here's a thing you should be thinking about. Here's why I don't think support champions are good for the game. Here's why the item system is the way it is now um but that's still five years of knowledge of tft constantly all the time and yeah someone just said onboarding tribal knowledge in companies is so hard yep i uh, i imagine i don't know this for sure but i imagine a company like blizzard working on world of warcraft one of their biggest challenges is just finding people to work in their tribal knowledge tools and understand what they've done in the past and what they've learned from and things like that I know League of Legends has that. Every time we get somebody new, it's like, all right, welcome to Block Builder. Here's the years of tribal knowledge you've got to learn. So it's a lot of it. And and even then, right, like there's a big difference between, hey, here's this thing you should know. And here's the context of why you should know it. And here, let me explain how it's useful, right? Like writing down the knowledge is one thing. We, we see this just with human knowledge in general that like context is important. So the, the, so to back it up to your, to your initial question, um, how is this easily reachable for a new member arriving on the team? I consider one of my primary jobs now. And the reason I keep my schedule very open is if you have a question, just ask me, 
I, I, I want to think of myself as an encyclopedia of TFT. And I want people to be like, hey, Mort, you got 10 seconds to answer this question? Yeah, no problem. Happy to help. Um, one of the harder parts is that then you create this barrier. Like, people think, oh, it's Mort. He's too busy. I can't I can't bother him. And you have to, like, train everyone. You're like, no, ask Mort. Seriously. Uh, and I've got a few good designers who are, like, literally once a week, they're like, okay, here are the questions I have this week. Can you, can you tell me why we're doing this? Um, but, you know, it's just... It's a lot of knowledge, right? And when you've been thinking about TFT for four years straight, you pick up a lot. And then there, then there are things that aren't... The other, here's the other part of this, and I do want to talk about this, is that a lot of TFT knowledge and game design knowledge is subjective. It's what we know currently. It's not necessarily the right answer. Uh, here's an example. Why is TFT a draft game? Right? Well, TFT is a draft game because it started as a draft game, and the first people who made Nauto Chess made it a draft game. Should it be a draft game? What if it wasn't a draft game? What would happen if it wasn't a draft game? These are interesting discussions that, right? Like, we don't have the actual concrete answer. There's never been a time to prove that absolutely the game would be better as a draft game, you know? And so stuff like that is like, there's just so much new stuff to be acquiring that even someone like me, there's a lot of new knowledge to be thought of. What does draft game mean? Bags. Uh, shared bag system. The fact that everyone shares a bag system. That's what I mean. Not not constructed in the sense of build your own deck, but like an example here would be, you know, are the bag sizes right? Should they be bigger, smaller, independent, whatever, right? Like these are the kind of things that need to be explored. So. Okay. For me, a set is good when the champions just look cool in game. Many of set 10 champions kind of don't achieve any fantasy that I think to myself looks cool. Direct opposite of set 9 was just so cool and amazing. How much of make the units have fun looking spells is part of the design of the game? Uh, okay, so first off, what you, what you started that question with was, was a very subjective opinion, right? You said, I think set 10 champs don't look cool. Set 9 champs look cool. My guess is there are probably people that would say the opposite, right? So looking cool is a very subjective thing, right? I think it's cool that Jin fills his bench with, uh, with turrets. I think that's cool. I think it's cool Lux shoots a laser. But again, everything's subjective. To your second part of the question though, how much of make the units have fun looking spells as part of the game design of the game? Actually a lot, actually a lot. You're not wrong, right? Like this is very important. We think it's one of the reasons why we do better than a lot of other auto battlers is watching TFT combat is kind of fun. It's kind of cool to watch somebody like shoot a laser or get punched in the face or snipe them in the, you know, it's very satisfying. Whereas you watch a lot of other auto battlers and they're like kind of dull to watch. It's very flat. Um, so we definitely want to make them look cool, especially at five cost. Um, so it is important. Now, again, though, the problem is how do you measure it? Well, that's subjective, right? Some people will think a bunch of violins on your bench is cool. And for that exact same design, someone else will go, it just fills your bench. That's dumb. Yeah, yeah, you know, and neither are wrong. It's subjective, so... Do you think this set is the hardest one to understand and adapt for, especially new or casual players? No. I I guess I would turn this question around and say, what is it about this set that you think makes it harder than, say, set 5 or set 7 uh, or set 8, right? Like, what is it specifically, right? Because I, I, I admittedly, some people will come to me with this feedback and they're like, set hard. And you're like, cool. Can you be specific? What is it? The only thing I can think of is headliner. That's really the only difference, right? Because everything else is just, it's just a TFT set. The only difference is that to really be good at it, you can't just log into a game and go, I'm playing uh, KDA and I will force KDA every time. Um, you can't do that this set because of headliner, because of the distribution of headliner. And so 
then it boils down to the question being is it hard for new players to play tft if they can't force yeah a little so is the answer that we should always let new players force maybe that's an interesting discussion point right but if they do force how do we then get them to be better at the game and the other dangerous part here is when forcing becomes optimal we're screwed right we're absolutely screwed so basically the problem actually becomes hey we need new players to be able to force but we need forcing to not be optimal and we need new players to understand how to go from forcing to not forcing to become better players that is the eternal struggle of tft um but one of the reasons we think tft has been successful in the long term is because it's a deep game right it's a deep game um and if you want to get better at it, there's a lot of ways to get better at it. And so for people that want a really deep, engaging, fulfilling gameplay experience, you've got TFT. So. Hey Mort, now that Riot has been able to get custom lobbies for arena mode, is there any more definite plans to add custom double up lobbies, potentially opening up an actual double up competitive scene? So. Uh, the answer to this is yes. Uh, I think a lot of the work that Arena had to do is work that we'll be able to piggyback off of, and that should help us get custom double up lobbies. Uh, that being said, I would keep your expectations in check. I'm pretty skeptical of a major double up competitive scene. I think there will be fun double up tournaments, but I would not expect Riot to start like an actual double up competitive scene. That seems unrealistic. And I think the mode itself needs a lot of love before we can go down that road anyway. Um, double up right now is not in a good state. Um, too many spatulas, way too easy to force gross things, it's just, and the bugs. Um, double up needs some love. So I think we would need to fix those first. Is there a space in TFT for more or less players game mode, like four or six or maybe 10? Uh, well, first what I can say is Fight for the Golden Spatula actually experimented with a 100 player mode uh, and it, it existed. It, it, it was fine. Um, it wasn't great. Like you lost three times and then you were out and you just felt bad that you lost a lot. Turns out when there's 100 players, you lose 99 times. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't amazing uh it didn't end up being that popular um that being said when when coming up with ideas like this it's the wrong approach right like someone saying like could there be more or less players yeah sure you could snap your fingers anytime and like okay now there's 12 players 19 players whatever why right the question is what's the goal what are you trying to accomplish in your design how does it make the game better Right? If someone came to me and said, hey, I think it's very imperative that players need to have a closer relationship with their opponents, and at eight players, that's impossible, so we're going to lower it to four so that you really understand your opponents and how they, they counter them and stuff like that. Yeah, maybe. But that at least I'm hearing a reasoning, right? Like I'm hearing very clearly why a four player might be good. Um, I feel less people would make a good shortened game mode. Okay, but see, then, so that's, you jumped to the answer before the, the goal, right? If the goal is make a shorter TFT mode, great. Let's talk about that goal, right? We can talk about the goal of make a shorter TFT mode and then talk about what tactics get us to that shorter mode. But jumping all the way to there should be four players, you've gone too far, right? And this is why when you're, a lot of the times when you're communicating designs, you have to like, when I present a design for TFT to the team or my bosses, what I go is like problem statement, blank, 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 blank. This is, this is this. Therefore, goal, make this true. And here are the tactics we're going to do to make it true, right? A, a problem statement might be using legends as an example. Problem statement. People don't feel like they can identify their play style. And therefore, we're going to make legends to try to do that, right? Like, that's an example of how you want to pitch an idea rather than just, wouldn't it be cool if? So something to think about when you're presenting your ideas. Ooh, this is an interesting question. 
What is your best parenting tip or trick? Ooh. So I, I want to preface this with saying I consider myself a C tier parent. I'm an okay parent. You know, I don't abuse my kids. I don't treat them like crap. I, I, I'm an okay parent. But like, could I pay more attention and help them better with their homework and stuff? Yeah, probably. Like, I, I don't know. I think I'm okay. So take everything I say in parenting with a grain of salt. I don't consider myself an expert in the space. That being said, I think uh, my best parenting tip or trick would just be treating them like an adult. Uh, even like, you know, my little nieces and stuff like that. It's just like, you never baby talk them. You just like treat them like another person. And you'll be surprised how much they become their own person. So. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to treat them that differently. They're just, treat them like people. But again, like that's, it's not the best thing out there. So. Hey Mort, love TFT, but I do find it frustrating having to relearn so much every set. Is there anything that can be done or maybe is in the works to mitigate the difficult learning curve of a new set? Or is it just always going to be a pain point in the game that changes sets? Um, this is a really interesting question. It was one of those fundamental questions of TFT in the first few years. Was like, was sets even the correct choice, right? Because you know when we lost the most players was when we went from set one to set two. Um... You know, and there were a bunch of players that were like, wait, I have to relearn everything? Pfft, peace out. I'm never playing this game again. And that's okay. Um, there are going to be people that have that opinion. I always use Brian Kibler as the most famous example. Like, we always felt like Brian Kibler would like TFT, but he really didn't want to relearn everything over and over. Um, but there are also people that love that. Um, there's a good YouTube video I always bring up when this comes up too. It's the, uh, I'm going to blank on the terms. Gosh, dang it. Um, it was the Honer versus the Innovator. Honer versus Innovator. That's what it is. So if you YouTube Honer versus Innovator. Um, fighting games, games like chess are for Honers. TFT, we have made a very clear, it's for Innovators. It, we're the type of player that want to learn a new thing, come up with a new solve, but as soon as it gets stale, actually want to quit. Um... And so we've just accepted that we are a game for innovators, not for honers. Um, and so the reality is, if you're somebody that likes to be an innovator and likes a new puzzle to solve and likes a new thing to try to create and play, TFT is the game for you. But if you find that annoying and, and painful and you'd rather pick a game that's not going to change that much, TFT is probably not that best game. Um, but that's the thing. When you're making a game, if you try to appeal to both, you're just going to appeal to nobody. So, so for now, we've accepted that our sets are going to force you to learn. Um, League is more of a honer game. Yeah, you're right. You're actually right. League is more of a honer game, which is why TFT doesn't also need to be a honer game. So TFT is an innovator game. We don't need to overstep on leagues and serve the exact same audience as League. We, uh, we don't need to do that. So you're actually right. But yeah, so it will always be a pain point that it is what it is. Uh, by the way, I do recommend that YouTube video. If you've never watched that YouTube video, I think it's a very good YouTube video. The Honors versus Innovators from Core A. It's like a 15 minute video and you should watch it. Hey Mort, what are your goals for 2024? We know we have three more sets on the way and two set revivals amongst those, but is there anything specifically you want to achieve for the new year? I assume you mean in Riot terms. Uh, in terms of Riot, the big thing I want to achieve... So, again, this is going to sound a little arrogant, but uh, every set in TFT, I've had to jump on near the end and doing... Uh, do a lot of like final fixing and like improvements on the set to make sure it was good. The amount of work I put into set 10 to get it to the state it was in was too much. Um, sometimes this is done through people or whatever, but I've, I've had to do a lot of like organization, finalization, if you will. Um, kind of like the ultimate finalizer. I want to get the team to a point 
where they don't need me as much. That's my big goal for 2024. I don't, I want to ship a set where I like kind of looked at it, gave a few pointers and then they shipped a great set versus I looked at a set and spent a month reworking half of it. That's, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Train your replacement. That's a big thing. So that's what I, that's what I, that's my big goal other than the stuff you mentioned. Okay, well, this is an easy question. Uh, hey, Mort, I love Double Up. Is there any current plans to change how easy or cheap it is to get spatulas and emblems from the armories? Yes. Uh, Double Up is one of our next bigger projects. To, we need to get that mode out of Workshop. We need to improve that mode. And one of the things on that agenda is those, those gift armories are kind of nonsense right now. They're all over the place. Um, they're too inflationary, stuff like that. So, yep. It, it definitely needs some work. That's one of the areas that needs work. Oh, okay. All right. When four cost Fiora returned in set 9.5, everyone was excited, but it turned out the de aggro mechanic was not as fun as we remembered. After a few patches, you change it, and everyone was so happy. Eh, were they happy or were they nondescript because it was not a problem anymore but she was actually just a bad champion so everyone forgets her i wouldn't call that happy i would call that we pushed the problem out of the way um now in set 10 we got a collie that has backline access and diagro one of my friends that is more casual on tft told me everyone hates that mechanic why try it again next set make it even better and they will never learn to listen what would you tell him ah so again this is we talked about this briefly earlier but just because something fails once does not mean you should never do it again, right? So you're telling me because one aggro drop was a little frustrating, we should never, ever, ever ship an aggro drop? That's how you get a really closed mind. That's how you get a lack of growth mindset. and You just give up on all ideas. Um, instead, we should feel like, okay, is there a way to make de-aggro healthy, right? Do you balance around that de-aggro? Um, you know, you mentioned Akali being frustrating, and I think Akali is a little frustrating, and ha assassins are inherently frustrating. Um, but I think actually Akali is, like, pretty fine. She has ramping damage. She has to ramp up. Most fights, she kills, like, one or two characters that you didn't position around. I mean, a first-time chatter being a little condescending here, but says Akali deals no damage, so it's fine. Kind of true. Kind of true. But, but, that doesn't mean she's perfect. Don't get me wrong. Um, I also agree that her dropping aggro is a little frustrating. I think the amount she heals can be frustrating. I think uh, her tuning, her, actually, what I'll also say is Akali existing in the same set as Karthus was not great. So, um, how does she ramp up? Uh, every time she casts, she applies the shuriken on somebody, and each time she hits more and more targets with her spell. So she ramps up. Um, so I don't know. I, w I would tell them that like, just because something is a little frustrating doesn't mean it's inherently bad, but, but I get it. So I get it. And that's why, again, like the answer can't just be though, that like it was frustrating once, therefore never do it again. I think we have to push. I think there is a version of untargetability that is okay. We just have to find what that is. Or we eventually we give up on it. But Oops. Okay. Would it be okay for the game to have no spatula in the first carousel, or would you guys rather solve this by balancing what spatula gives as an extra, like lowering true damage power, etc.? So again, this is where I would say focus on the core issue first is you mentioned spatula on first carousel is a problem. Is it a problem? Is, is why is it a problem? Are there are eight spatulas you can build are all eight of them causing a problem or is one of them causing a problem? If the answer is one of them, then the answer probably isn't that spatulas are the problem. The answer is probably that the true damage emblem is the problem. Um, from what I can tell, no one's freaking out about their early 2-1 Ebo emblem or their Jazz emblem or anything like that. It seems like it's just the true damage is too strong. 
So the answer is nerf the true damage one. So, and that's why, again, like, it's, sometimes I really hate Reddit analysis because, like, you jump to the wrong conclusions with the wrong facts. But, yeah, it, from what I can tell, it really is, like, true damage emblem's too good. Or, you know, buff the other spat lines. Yeah, that's also true, actually. Um, you could buff some of the other ones. That being said, I think, like, KDA is, like, acceptable. But, yeah, if you, like, imagine if right for now you said you could not build a true damage emblem with an early spat. Would it be OP? I don't think so. Why is true damage emblem strong? Because it comes with, so the true damage emblem, let's say you're running four true damage, right? Four true damage is, and you're gonna mock me because I don't remember this off the top of my head, but 30%, four true damage is 30%, right? Just four true damage. Yeah, okay, great. Um, the emblem gives an additional 10% as its bling bonus um, just for equipping it, which means if you're running four true damage, the emblem is giving you 40% damage. Um, at six, that 45 becomes 55. And that was something we were like, hey, if you have an emblem, you need a bling bonus. But I think the reality is either the traits just over budget or the bling bonus um, was unnecessary. So I think that true damage emblem, you could literally delete that extra 10% bling bonus and it'd still be fine. So, yeah. So, which is probably what you're going to see in the patch notes. You're probably going to see it get either deleted or reduced to like 2%, and it'll be fine. All right. I am so far behind on questions. You mentioned that you sometimes have to hard veto mechanics other people suggest, but you have to do it rarely. How often does that actually happen? And what kinds of things have been hard vetoed? Uh, well, I'm not going to throw the team under the bus and mention the things that I've had to hard veto because then what will happen is someone in chat will go, what? Someone suggested that thing? How do they even have a job? And I'm not really looking to deal with that. But as far as how often? On a rough average, once every two weeks? Once every two weeks? Uh, I've, I've made a very clear communication tool with my team so that they know. For example, let's say my t the team pitches an idea and I go, that's a terrible idea. The team's allowed to go, don't care. Don't care. I think it's good. I can ignore Mort. Uh, if I say the keyword, I order you to take this out. I, I have to say, if I say this is an order, then they know, okay, no, I'm being hard vetoed. And again, I try to use that tool rarely so that it has meaning when it's being said. I have found that helps communication because otherwise you don't want people saying the your feet. Like one of the worst things I've seen is like somebody important comes in and gives you feedback and then people blindly follow that feedback. You don't want that, right? Cause like, hey, you've got more context than I do. You don't need to blindly listen to everything I say. So I might say something like, hey, I think this music's not as cool as I'd like it to be. Or, hey, I think this doesn't look right. But I'm not an expert. You guys are the expert. You'll figure it out. But then if I say, hey, I order you to make this feel better, it's a big deal. And so, um, but again, I would say I do that maybe once every two weeks at most. Probably less than that. As far as things that have been hard vetoed, like I said, I'm trying to think of a really good example that doesn't throw anyone under the bus. Because someone in chat mentioned Rushdown. And even Rushdown, I didn't hard veto. I let Kent make it so that he could learn how bad it was, and then we killed it. I didn't hard veto rush down, even though I knew it was bad. I'm trying to think of a hard veto. There have been a couple augments that are pretty wild. I guess I'll just leave it at that. There's definitely been an augment where someone pitched this, and I would say, like, no, I order you to not waste time on this. This is really bad and will break the game. So... Yeah. Do you have any advice about transitioning from indie dev to AAA? I feel like portfolio filled with platformer single player games, even if they are pretty well known, wouldn't be of particular interest for companies like Riot. Ooh, I disagree. I disagree on this one. So as the person who worked at Nintendo making Mario vs. Donkey Kong puzzle games, a crosswords game, 
and then went, hey, Riot, I want to make League of Legends and TFT. Um, I think what type of game you are making isn't that relevant. It's a little relevant. Don't get me wrong. Like, an MMO dev is going to want a bunch of people who have already worked on MMOs. That's true. But if the company is worth their, their salt even a little, uh, what they're going to see is somebody who shipped a bunch of games, right? Just shipping games is massive. And so I would be looking at this person going, wow, you shipped a bunch of games. Tell me what you learned. And as long as they have a growth mentality, I'd be hiring that person in a heartbeat because finding people with even just a moniker of experience that have shipped games. And especially the other thing I'll say is at an indie dev or a small dev studio, you find yourself wearing a lot of hats. Uh, I'm not a UX designer, but I've turns out I did a lot of UX design work because there were four designers at Nintendo and someone had to do it. And so I just did it and you learn the thing. And then you also learn some project organization because you had to run a, 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 t a big section of the team and like, People from indie studios often have like a very, I think we call them T-shaped where it's like they can do a lot of things and one thing really well. Um, so I just don't agree that you'd say they're not particular interest for Riot. I think they'd be very interested. And I think the step one is apply and, you know, show that you've got interest in their space and it'd be good. So. Hey, Mort, wanted to ask you kind of a different question. It's my career dream to be able to work at Riot, but I don't have any experience in the games industry as it's really hard to find entry-level jobs there. Yep. Especially if it's not computer science related. Yep. Is there any advice you would give to those who want to work at a company like Riot, but are finding it difficult to enter the games industry, especially those with no technical background? Uh, so again, I always use Kent as the example here, but if you, you're right, that it is get hard to get into the games industry right now. Um, the other thing is that you shouldn't look at a company like Riot, like a big, big company, and be like, that's the first thing I want to apply to, right? Like, you got to get some professional industry experience somewhere else. Um, so get a little professional experience somewhere else. That will matter a bunch. Uh, if you can get that, then I think you're in a good spot because just some professional experience is good. And so again, I'll use Kent as the example. Kent was working in finance at Blizzard. Um, yes, it was at Blizzard, but he was basically finance and payroll. But he had interest in the space, learned the professional, like, you know, working in an environment, and then came to us with a lot of, like, TFT understanding and interest in the space and made a, a good candidate, you know? So my advice is find a job, be good at that job for a bit for a first year or two, and then start applying. And again, build that per portfolio in the background, so... Say, for instance, that you had to move to a different Riot game. Let's hope not. What game would you like to work on, bring the most value to? So I'm not going to give you an answer of a specific game, mostly because, A, I couldn't talk about half the games anyway. But here's what I will say. I've learned over the 17 years that my superpower is I'm, like, one of the best finishers in the industry. I'm not the guy that comes up with, like, a cool idea. I'm just not. But I can take your cool idea and make it fun make it fast and actually get it done and actually get it out the door. Um, so I think if there was a game that someone had a, a really good uh, idea for and they were really solid about it, but they needed to finish it like the last two years on a project, I'm the best designer. Why is chat going, huh? What did I say? Sort of like a publisher manager. No, not like that. It's more like the details, right? A lot of the, if you look at the, uh, if you look at TFT, for example, right? TFT is the kind of game where like you get a slight number wrong in terms of like balance or distribution or systems or things like that. The game falls apart. And TFT is the kind of game where a bad designer working on those systems could break the game and make it never ship. Um, but understanding those systems and how to make it into a solid experience, that's the thing I'm really good at. So I would... I would want to join a Riot project that's like two years away from shipping and put it all together and make it actually ship. That would be my job. So I'm, I'm pretty good at that.
How far away are we from the rotating shop? Can we expect an update on that soon? Uh, I don't know the full answer on this. What I know is the team is working hard on that. Um, I hope they have an update soon. I can't give you, again, it's not my area, so I can't give you a specific. Um, but I know it's definitely still on the roadmap. So uh, for those who are wondering what they're talking about, rotating shop is like the ability to get old content and things like that through various means. So um, team is still working on that. Morning Mort, as someone who loves his job and is also salaried, I'm prone to overdoing it from time to time and hit various phases of burnout. How do you manage those overwhelming moments where the burnout starts to creep in? Is that something you even deal with a lot? Yes. So this is another one of those secrets of my success that I don't have like the massive answer for everyone, but I can tell you this. And what I mean is you need to learn where your line is and recognize it immediately. Uh, I too, like as much as I'm a workaholic and as much as I work like crazy, I also have levels of burnout. I do. I'm like, I just don't want to work today. Um, the trick is knowing where that line is. And when you recognize it, accepting it and just going, yep, this is going to have to wait till tomorrow. Uh, to give a very concrete example, there was some day, it was a Sunday I was working on some patch I probably shouldn't have been working on on a weekend or whatever. And I started working at like 7 a.m. And I was doing my thing and I was working and I was liking it. And around 4 p.m. I could just feel my brain draining. And I'm just like, nope, I still have five costs to do. They're going to wait till tomorrow. I'm just going to, nope, I'm going to unplug it. I'm going to walk away because I'm reaching my line. Uh, and that's just a single day example. There are longer term examples too, where it's like you've been working on a thing and you can just feel your brain going, nope, I need to stop. When you learn that line, it's really valuable because then you can walk away and turn your brain off. Um, but I've also, one of my, my the engineering buddy, Dean, I worked with, for example, he was much worse at this. He would just keep powering through. He's like, this thing needs to be done. And he would work and work and work and work. And then he'd burn himself out. And that's like, I had to actually help him sometimes. I'd be like, dude, stop. Like, it'll it'll wait. Um, but that's the skill you've got to practice is knowing where your line is and knowing when you can turn off that brain and walk away. Because if you don't, that's how you burn out. And so, yeah, like the programmer falling asleep at their desk, right? Like they crossed that line three hours ago. You just, you have to learn where your line is and recognize it so figure out where your line is and this you know hilariously enough this is actually even true of like tft ranked grinders it's like figure out where your line is and stop playing after like so, should soju probably stop streaming you know after a certain point where he's just losing a bunch of games yeah probably probably have you guys had someone fall asleep on the tft team no no we're not that insane All right, uh, new player feedback. Game feels fun in first 10 minutes and after level eight when you roll and spend all gold. Mid game kind of feels kind of boring, barely anything to do, just saving gold for interest. Anything to address that in the next set? Hmm, interesting, interesting. I mean, kind of what you're describing, I could see that perspective. There are some players that are just like, I like getting an early direction and then I like fast forwarding to the end. Um, I would say for a player like that, the we would want to we would want to, if anything, make a mode that serves that player need. But I think the core game, the mid game, is important. I think the mid game is where there's actually the most skill expression right now because you're eventually what you're saying is is a very common. Notice it's it's a very common pattern though, right? It's like I log into a game, I want to figure out what I'm playing. The game tells me I'm playing KDA. And then I want to see a cool KDA board at the end. That, that's a very common new player experience. Like, I actually kind of agree that this person has a very common experience for a new player. I, I do. Um, but I'm not sure that the answer is eliminate the skill expression there. 
I think if anything, that's when you learn like what the mid game is and how, like, I don't know. I think that's the part of the game that keeps us deep and I wouldn't want to get rid of that. So, but again, I understand it. There are definitely people that want to fast forward to that like end game board. So I guess what I say is I acknowledge that you're like the way you're feeling is very common. It is very common, but would I change anything? I don't know that I would. I mean, we, we kind of already did this set, right? This set, we made level 8 easier to get to by lowering the XP so that you could skip past level 6 and 7 relatively quickly. So I think that was kind of the action we already took. But I wouldn't do much more than that. So so I guess to answer your question, anything to address that in the next set? Probably not, is the honest answer. Hey, Mort, what do you find the key aspects of skill expression are in TFT? I'm always moving friends into playing TFT with me, and I'm trying to figure out what things to focus on teaching them. Um, so there's two different questions in there. The first question is, what do you want to focus on teaching new players? Uh, I think focus teaching new players on some of the basics, like how to use items and things like that, um, so that they understand, like, here's how you can position, stuff like that. The other thing you're asking is, what are the key aspects of skill expression? I think the kill aspects of skill expression are, is if you think of TFT as this like game of branching paths, where at the start of the game, any comp could be possible. And as soon as you drop a tier, all of a sudden there's a bunch of branches that have closed off in your mind and a bunch of branches that have opened up in your mind where it's like, oh, okay, I had a tier. I could be leaning towards blue buff Ari, or I could be leaning towards Shojin TF or whatever, right? You start seeing the paths. And as more things happen in the game, whether it be your item drops or the champions or things like that, those branches start to converge. And understanding how to weave that decision tree of TFT is the skill expression that's really fun. Um, so that's the thing I believe is the key skill expression is understanding from infinite possibilities how to go to the actual possibility you should be heading towards and playing around the things that have happened in your game, right? We've seen games where it's like, I'll be going down a path and then something ha happens where it's like, I'll, I'll see this unit or this augment and now I'm going down a different path. And it's like, that's the skill expression of TFT. So we just finished a playlist, by the way. So I'm going to switch to this song. Cool. All right. We're at the, I'm an hour behind now. Whoops. Copy. Paste. So one thing I realized about games I really love is that the moment when I say, oh, wow, I didn't know you could do that. How do we get more of that in TFT? Ooh. Do we want more of that? Do we want more moments where players are going, I didn't know you could do that? Because right now, every time we get a moment like that, Players are usually like, why didn't the game give me a direct text message to tell me that thing in my head? <laughs> so I don't know that we want more of that. Don't give me, but at the same time, I think, no, actually, no, I, I take it back. I think finding the right ways to make cool things happen in a sense of discovery is important. I'll use Leduck as an example. I think Zephyr was an item that many people considered very, very boring. And Zephyr. And then when Leduck started going, hey, look, I can build five of them and do uh, silly things with it. Players went, wait, I didn't know you could do that. That's fun. And Zephyr all of a sudden became a more fun item. So I think the way we do that is create more avenues for players to explore things. And I'll give you a teaser here. I think one of the areas now that is very ripe for this is artifacts. I think we have a lot of potential in the artifact space to create a lot of cool interactions of like, oh, I didn't know that could do this thing. And I think that could do some fun stuff. So, so I guess the, the question is, how do we get more of that? We find more interesting design spaces that aren't all knowledge-based. So. 
Yeah. Hey Mort, in the past you've mentioned using specific units, traits, or even comps being used as a bar or essentially a reference point for balancing a set. How do you decide what is considered a bar or reference point for balance? Is it decided during the design stage or decided when the set goes live? Uh, it's decided during the, during the design stage. And the way we do that, one second. Um, the way we do that is we first, so you'll, if you, if when you see the, uh, the balance framework thing that we did at Vegas, it'll talk about how fight pacing is supposed to be between 18 and 25 seconds. So first off, we're looking for a comp that already fits that 18 to 25 seconds. And then the other thing is sort of as a set design lead or a systems lead, we look at a champion that's like, hey, I'm really happy with this output. Uh, I used Ezreal this set because I really liked Ezreal as a spell. It was like single target spell, single target spell, big AOE spell, right? He had this like ramp up. It felt really healthy. He could kill a unit or two and then cast that big spell. And he felt like a really healthy pattern. Whereas someone like Lux, there are going to be fights where Lux just like instantly deletes the back line and you're like, that's not healthy. Um, so it's like, what champion has a healthy pace of combat? And then once we have that, figuring out the numbers, and then when we have that going, okay, this is our bar. So fight pacing is the biggest one. It's using fight pacing to determine that. And by creating that bar, then we have everything we can balance around to try to get to that bar. So like anytime we were testing KDA, uh, you would put it up against an Ezreal comp and see how it would go. But there are flaws to this. For example, uh, the GAT team was doing a lot of testing around KDA and they kept finding melee would lose every fight. And it's like, well, yeah, turns out Ari's just really good at deleting melee units, you know? And so sometimes you have to be able to take those other things into consideration as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. GAT team, I know. Uh, how's the rank distribution throughout a set? Does the average player find themselves in silver and finish in gold? Just curious since I have a skewed vision of ranked. So I'm going to see if this website still has it here because I can't tell you the public stuff. So let's see here. Ranking, leaderboards. Yeah, okay. At the very least, publicly, I'm going to link it in chat here. If you click this link... Uh, you can see kind of the average ranked distribution that is publicly available. And that can show you a graph of what it looks like. Um, but this is why I always hate when people who are like, oh, you're only Emerald? You're terrible at the game. No, no, no you're not terrible at the game. You're, you're quite good. You're not quite as good as, you know, the people who play whatever. Why do you say publicly? Because obviously our data is going to be a little different. Um... You know, we have the official stuff, but it's close enough. It's close enough. So, and yeah, you can look at this graph and it's like, yeah, a lot of gold four players and silver four players. So, so Emerald one is non-existent by this chart. I mean, yeah, it's because a lot of people that get to Emerald one usually just push and then hit diamond four. It's pretty normal. So. So there you go. Okay. Hey Mort, I'm wondering if we'll ever get fancy arenas to outright purchase again. Maybe with eggs that give the potential for the special chibis. Thinking Jinx Golden Arena. I know we all complained about the cost of things like the Golden Tiger Market Arena Bundle, but truly I'd much rather purchase a guaranteed bundle for over 120 over spending hundreds on the treasure realms and letting RNG win or lose the day for me. The cost for nice things now seems much more overwhelming now. Yeah, this one's tricky. This one's tricky. There's a, like, man, there's a whole, like, monetization deep dive discussion you could do, and I'm not really the person who should be doing this much anymore. Uh, I did it a lot on League of Legends because I worked on the monetization on League. Um, but it's tricky. Right, because we, we've talked about this before, right? That like, let's say there's an arena that has a $200 maximum gotcha price. It's 
there are people who are going to say, I'd rather just see it for $200 in the store. And I get that, right? There's, a, there's some people that just don't like the randomness attribution of it. But there are other, like the logic part of your brain is like, but, but you could get it cheaper. Like, it's weird. And then there's the whole like human psychology part and the people who feel like they're being manipulated. And it gets, it gets really overwhelming. I don't want to spend the entire QA d diving into this. So instead, what I'll try to focus on is you mentioned arenas that are directly purchasable. And I think the answer to that is they kind of already are in the sense that there's the battle pass arenas, which is a little bit of a step removed. But basically, from what I can tell, there are two types of arenas being made now. There used to be three. There used to be the like tier one arenas that were very, very basic and plain. And what we found is nobody really liked those. They just, they just didn't like them at all. Um, then there's the like kind of cool arenas. I'll call them tier two arenas. Um, this is like, you know, the plant one that came at the end of the battle pass. I think it was set eight or set seven, right? They're like, they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool arenas. Um, those are the ones that we've been putting in the pass and you know, for $10, you get a, a cool pass. I think there's one at the end of this pass right now. Right. Um, so, and then there's the like really, really fancy arenas. Uh, the really, really fancy arenas are the ones that they've been putting in the gotcha system. And I think those are the, like the, the three, the three types right now. And again, the first type, no one liked the second type is essentially direct purchase through the pass. And the third is that I don't know that there'll ever be something in between where it's like, here it is for $30 in the store. Probably not. So I don't know. This this method seems to be working. So I just want one per year that you can directly buy instead of gotcha. Well, that's what I'm saying though. You're getting you're getting six per year now in the pass. And I think if you wanted something better than what's in the pass, it's probably only going to be gotcha. Is the real answer. So, but the pass ones are how the, I believe how the current team is filling that out. As design lead, what's the thing that you are the most proud of the TFT team for accomplishing? As a parent, what are you most proud of accomplishing? As a design lead, what's the thing I'm most proud of the TFT for accomplishing? So shipping games right now is really hard. Uh, there are games that will go seven years without shipping. There are games that will get delayed. There are, it's just, it's hard to ship work. The thing I'm the most proud of is for how small the TFT team was that we like never missed a set ship date. We shipped our sets. We've shipped 10 sets. We've been growing. I'm really proud of that. Um, never once missing a date, still shipping patches. Like the amount that we've been able to output with the, the size of our team is absolutely bonkers. I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of that. That's why I say like, being a good finisher, but I don't know. We've just done so much. As a parent, what are you most proud of accomplishing? I think if I had to pick one thing, I'm proud of the fact that my daughter is a kind-hearted person. Um, she's not selfish. She just cares about other people. She wants to do good. She wants to be a child psychiatrist. So somehow I've, I raised a daughter who is a very kind person. So that's a win. That's a win. Hey Mort, your thoughts on why assassins aren't healthy, but the set has a lot of backlane targeting units. Uh, really love the set, by the way. Thank you to you and the team. Yeah, so the reason I believe assassins aren't healthy is you get a large group of units who all of their identity is kill the thing in the back, right? Like. When you had four or six assassins, um, it was just like, well, backline's gone, end of fight. Uh, that being said, I do not think backline access is unhealthy. Uh, I think sometimes it is good to be able to like have threats to the backline. This is where if you ignore Akali's aggro drop for a second, I think Akali is a good example where it's like, hey, you gotta be careful, Akali's on your backline. 
Otherwise, it just becomes this like front to back. Whoever can build the best tank wins, which is not great. Um, I think Caitlyn's another good example where like Caitlyn will snipe a few units, but not everyone. Um, I think those are good. That being said, it was interesting because one of my bosses came to me and was like, yeah, he's which again, this is a controversial opinion, but one of my bosses was actually like, I think we've moved too far. I think there's not enough backline access. And his particular opinion was he wanted more fights that take place in the backline. Things like edgelords. And again, I understand that opinion. I'm not sure I agree with it, but it's weird because like some people like the front to back. Some people don't front to back is easiest to understand. But the thing I have figured out is 100% what people don't like is I built a carry, right? Let's say, I, let's say I'm playing Caitlyn. I built a Caitlyn. I put three items on her. I'm ready to see this cool fantasy of Caitlyn, the three item carry. And she dies first. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes it when that happens. That's the thing that is very, very frustrating. And so... As long as that happens later in the fight, or not quite first, but not quite last, I think we're okay. I like it when I'm not the Caitlyn. Yeah, well, yeah. So. Hey Mort, why do I still have to go to a different website to see TFT patch notes and why is there still no patch notes page in the TFT tab? <sighs> Hang on. I would like to see something real quick. Hmm. What's there usually? Yeah, there, I swear there was a TFT. Mm. Anyway, uh, to answer your question, why do I still have to go to a different website to see the TFT of patch notes and why is there no patch notes page in the TFT tab? So this is the kind of question that I'll admit, like, okay, the, the answer is because it's a, a tech thing, because our client doesn't support that easily updated, blah, blah, blah. But I also push back on this question because what does this change? Like, I, I've never understood, okay, now if the TFT patch notes are in the client, how does your game get better? Is this what you want us spending our time on? That, like, cool, now I'll be able to see the patch notes in the client instead of opening up a tab. But, like, you can open up a tab. Like, there's this weird, like, fundamental thing where you're just, like, it, it, it be, it's like a matter of principle more than actual practicality. So, I don't know. I just don't understand it. Better for casual players who won't open up tabs. See, that's, again, it's this matter of principle. Like, do you think casual players are, like, rushing to not play the game because there's no patch notes in the client? I don't think so. The few games I've seen that do have it, here's what most people do. They go, okay, and they hit play. They skip past it. it I don't know. To me, it just does not seem like the right use of time, development time. It's like people want it because they want their game to feel modern, but they don't actually need it for the thing. So I don't know. Like I said, we have tech limitations, but I think the reason we don't prioritize those tech limitations is because most people don't actually use it anyway. The people who want to read patch notes are willing to click an extra tab and read the patch notes. So... The person that reads patch notes is engaged enough to open the tab. Yeah, that's kind of my that's kind of my point. So I don't know. If it were up to me, which it's not always, but if it were up to me, would I have someone spend time on doing that? Nah. Nah. Hey Mort, how do you feel about the headliner bonus traits being random? I feel like I play what the game gives me and try to pivot into a real build like Yone or Samira, but the builds do not work if I get the wrong trait bonus. Uh, if that's true, that just means the balance is off if you need a specific trait. 
I think for the most part, that's not true. Like, using Yone as an example, I think we've seen every version of Yone be acceptable. You can play Yone with Crowd Diver. You can play Yone with Edgelord. You can play Yone with Heartsteel. I think the one exception, and this is the one I haven't been able to figure out, um, there's a particular style of trait that getting plus one early has been wildly more powerful, and that's summon traits. Anytime you get a plus one on a summon trait, you summon them much earlier than normally intended. This was true of Void. This was true of Innovator. This was true of Country. And so I think Samira is an example where plus one country, yeah, very valuable. Plus one country is really, really good. Um, so. But I don't know. Part of it, I mean, if, if it's true that there are particular ones that you have to have a certain trait, then I think that's just a balance issue. But like Ari is a great example, right? Where you can play Ari with Spellweaver or KDA. They both work fine. Um, Caitlyn, you can play with 8-bit or Rapid Fire. Both work fine. So, if anything, it just sounds like Executioner is weak. Or plus one Hyper Pop feels pretty unwanted. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It just feels like then Hyper Pop needs some buffs. Rather than there's some weird fundamental flaw with the system. So... Hey Mortdog, how do you balance desire for fulfillment from your role with practicality? I have a great job currently that I don't find super rewarding, but I'm scared to start over in a new career to try to find fulfillment. Ah, this is a tricky question. This is like a life question. Um, I'm going to give you a kind of a bleak answer, which is more fulfillment is the kind of thing you can lose your mind chasing infinitely. You know, people with infinite money and infinite time and infinite fulfillment still aren't quite happy, right? There's always the next step. So just be careful when you're looking at like, am I, am I fulfilled? You might be, and you just might not realize it because it's human nature to always try to be more fulfilled than you currently are. Um, it's just, it's just human nature. So finding the way to be happy with what you have is tricky. Now, that's not to say that you should be happy with being unhappy. There is a difference between being unhappy and not. But like I said, even someone like me, I, I, I love my job. Uh, I love TFT. But there's a part of me that's like, but what if the next thing? But what if, you know, it's just, it's just human nature. So... Just be really sure you need it. Um, the hardest one for me in this world was like, I worked at Nintendo for 11 years. I was a game director. My name was the first name in the credits. And I was like, I think it's time for me to leave Nintendo. And that was hard. I had family members that were like, you're crazy. You're crazy. What are you doing? Uh, it ended up being the right move. But at the time was definitely one of those like it's really hard are you sure but i was very clear about what i wanted in that case i'd already worked on like six mario versus donkey Kong games nintendo was like we're either going to be porting more games or you're going to make a seventh and i wanted to see that i could make a different type of game i wasn't going to get that opportunity so i was very logical about it um so i think you have to be really logical if you're going to make that kind of thing but it can't just be about the generic fulfillment because, again, humans will always want more fulfillment. So. Okay. Uh, what's your opinion on blue buff as an item? It feels counterintuitive that an item made of two tiers work best on units with low mana costs. Interesting. Interesting. I could see that perspective. I feel like that's one that uh, you could argue both ways, right? Like the logical argument of someone with 30 mana benefits a lot from plus 10 mana over and over. So you want people casting rapidly. And I could see the argument of someone with a 200 mana spell should want the mana item. Uh, I think that's one you could logically justify either way. Uh, as far as what's my opinion on it as an item, it's fine. Uh, I'm glad that there's a few users of it, right? Like the Kaisas, the Aris of the world. 
I'm glad it doesn't work on Sona. Um, I think that's what Shojin's for. Now, here's the hot take, though. Kent and I have had this theory for a long time that there shouldn't be any mana items in the game. Um, trying to balance every mana... Ch every champion feels like they need the mana item. So, the problem is if we do that, then attack speed just becomes the mana replacement. And so everything would just be all attack speed items. Um, anyone that would want Shojin now just gets like Ginsu's or Red Buff or stuff like that. And you kind of already see that happening to some extent. Some people like Red Buff just because it's so much more attack speed. Um, so, I don't know. TLDR, how happy am I with it? I think it's okay. I think it's much healthier than it was before. So, Ooh, Tech Summers, how you doing? Uh, now that mid sets are gone, are you afraid that set 10 and future sets will be solved earlier than usual? Or do you take this as something good? So this is one of those, this is a great question. Uh, this is a question that I've always said in the past, if we ever got the game to a perfectly balanced state, we wouldn't touch it. And I stand by that, that's still true. If we got the game to a really good balanced state, balance patches would stop and we'd be like, bam, here you go. It's a, it's a perfectly balanced set, good, here we go. The challenge is, we don't actually know. We, we like in, fi in four years of TFT, we've never gotten to that step. Because um, there's always been something that's off. We might learn something. Like let's, let's say hypothetically 14.2 perfectly balances set 10. And then two patches later, everyone's like, I'm bored. We might see that in our player surveys. And then we might learn and we might have to start going, okay, we, we need something else. That being said, for most of our players, I think you're seeing some of the patterns of what we're going to see. I don't think it'll apply to players like you, Tech Summers, but you know we've got the, the old set revival coming up that will be uh, online at the same time. We've seen things like the For Fun patches. We've seen, uh, you know, if you look at that roadmap we presented, it shows a bunch of stuff that you'll be able to do during a set. So maybe people who have been playing set 10 for a while jump over to that set revival and play that for a little bit. So I think as long as we have stuff for you to do and play, that should be fine. But I think we're also about to learn what happens if a set's in a good state for two months. What happens? And I think that's a, a thing we're going to find out together. My hope is that players will actually realize that like, yeah, we can just play and learn and be good to go. But maybe we learn that, like, nope, what TFT players really want is solving a different meta every two weeks. And if we learn that, then our approach to balance will have to change. But TLDR, I'm kind of excited to learn that. I'm excited to see how that goes. Yes, this is an off-topic question. I do want to hear about someone who have lots of experience in the game industry IT. I'm a last year college student and struggling against internship. How do you deal with it when you're young, wild, and free? I mean, again, this is a pretty generic question in the sense that uh, there's a lot of things to go, but just the way, I, the, the thing I can advise is just approach it with that growth mindset, approach it that there's lots of time to learn, right? I've been doing this 17 years and I'm still learning things. Um, one of the things I see with young kids nowadays is they think that the way to success is prove they're the smartest person in the room. Um, and even if you are smart, you're not the most experienced person in the room. You need to not show up and go, I'm going to solve all the problems. You need to go and listen and learn and ask questions and get better. Um, so just look at everything as an opportunity to make yourself better at what you want to do. So, which again, I know is a generic answer, but yeah. Uh, hey Mort, when we had Legends, you were satisfied with them and how they managed to make the game easier to get info for newer players. Sort of, let's be clear. What made it easier for newer players about Legends? Twisted Fate. That's it. Was it Legends? Or was it Twisted Fate? If it's Twisted Fate, that's a different thing. We should talk about that. 
Obviously, they had problems in terms of balance, and the team decided not to keep them for now. Do you think that the removal of Legends plus the straightforward nature of set 10, less vertical center compared to set 9, was too much for new players going from set 9 to set 10 or not? Well, that was our big concern. So going into set 10, we were very nervous because, hey, we were adding skins again, which always means sets are harder to understand. It wasn't going to be force a vertical, and there weren't, you know, Twisted Fate Legend. Um, but what I'll say is early indication was that that wasn't true. That being said, I haven't actually checked our player numbers and player data since the break. So it's possible I come back from break and our insights people are freaking out because we've lost a bunch of players because the game's too complicated. It's possible. Or it's possible we come back and it's like, nope, we're having this the normal decline curve we do every set. Things are fine. Players are happy. Life is good. Um, I'll actually know more when I get back to work in January. Um, but what I'll say is set 10 started off on the right foot. It started off on a very good foot, which is why I got so touchy when people were like, players hate set 10. No, players liked set 10 a lot. Numbers were very good for set 10. Players were very happy with set 10. Um, part of that is marketing. Part of that is, you know, everything else but things were good so but we'll find out we'll find this is this is why like i said tft is a constant a constant trend there were definitely loud players that went i lost my pilt over cash outs but uh overall numbers were quite good How do you feel about the visual clarity of this set? Ooh, this is a hard question because remember that question earlier where someone was like, hey, uh, how do you make things look cool? One of the ways you make them look cool is you'd be really flashy. Uh, I think the other thing is that we made level nine more accessible. We made level 10 a thing. So that means there are more units on the board. Fights are inherently less clear. Uh, that being said, I don't know that visual clarity in that sense is actually something that TFT needs to have completely. I think there's something fun about the way fights start is they're very slow, they're very basic. And then as you reach like level eight, the fights get a bit chaotic. They, they're like, they ramp up in terms of like intensity. And then when they reach that pinnacle, it's like, holy crap, there's so much going on. And then the fight's winding down, and it's like, okay, it's my Jin versus their backline. Oh my god, ah! And you get these cool moments of tension within a fight that I think lead to a different type of clarity. Like, yes, you don't know when all 10 units are bashing up against each other exactly what's going on, but there's this moment where it's like, hey, uh, you know, you get the peaks and valleys, basically, and a, a cool storytelling to fights. So... Visual clarity has got down, but I think fight intensity has been pretty healthy. So, All right, we're at the halfway point. I'm going to restroom break real quick, and then we'll keep going. Be right back.
That was weird. I missed a bunch of text messages, but my wife took care of it. Okay, cool. All right, let's keep going. Is it worth the time and resources to make events such as the upcoming set revival for Hyper Roll and Double Up? Um, the reality is, even if it were, the bigger problem you have to solve in those situations is uh, the queue distribution. I think right now we're at a point where four or five is the right number of queues. Any more than that, and you've split everyone up too much. So do we really want a normals ranked double up hyper roll set revival normal set revival ranked set revival? Like, no, that's too many queues. So I think the bigger problem there is that. And so because of that, I wouldn't do that. So. Hey, Mort, if you had the ability to send one message to set one Mort, what would it say? Ooh. I think one message to set one more. I mean, how long can the message be? I think the short answer for a set one Mort. God, there's so many good ones. <laughs> Don't ship Pantheon. Yeah. Keep it simple and fun. Keep it simple and fun. I think most of our biggest mistakes was getting too clever, too complicated, things like shadow items. Keep it simple and fun. Ignore Reddit. Yeah, that's another good one. Be nice to players all the time. But keep it simple and fun, I think. Mort, I admire you as a fintech bis analysis wanting to someday be a PO designer in the game industry. What do you think of the most valuable assets in a PO in the gaming industry in contrast with more traditional bis? Uh, so hilariously enough, this is where, again, my lack of Western industry knowledge can show. I don't actually know what a bis is. Um, but what I'll tell you is the most valuable asset in a PO in the gaming industry is having a very clear vision and working with the right people. Like, um, basically the best product managers I've ever worked with or product owners at Riot are the people that like, they've got their expert designer, they've got their expert engineer, they've got their expert artist, and they bring them all together and to like push towards that key goal. So having that good understanding of a goal and a team. Um, Anna Donlin, the executive producer of Valorant, is a good example of this, where she just always builds like a crack team around her and then uses those to push towards her goals in a great way. Um, I think she's probably like the pinnacle of product owners that I've seen at Riot. So, but learning to recognize the people that are actually skilled. So it's, it becomes a bit of a people skill thing, right? You have to understand who actually are skilled and who are not just talking out their ass, um, which is in, in and of itself inherently a skill. So, yeah. Uh, hello, Mort. What do you think were the best and weakest sets and what did the team learn from those? Best sets, set four, set six, set nine, set 10. Um, learned content is key, learned having exciting things is fun, things that are very memorable, good legendaries, stuff like that. Weakest sets, two, five, two, five, seven, two, five, seven. All of which I would say are keep it simple. That's why I go back to the keep it simple. Um, set two was complicated and didn't add enough fun stuff. Five was shadow items. <laughs> Seven was dragons, which ended up being just more complexity without much excitement. So that's the quick version. Hey Mort, I'm sorry if this has been asked already, but have there been any thoughts into adding a guide to help you move towards certain comps? Like a pick me, I'm good with X traits. This is an interesting question. 
because there's this interesting line that keeps getting explored in all games where how much do you have the game play for you and give you information before it becomes less about playing a game and i think there are examples of this in league right with like jungle timers and there are examples of this even within tft where it's like adding the item uh, inspect panel and stuff like that but i think the best example of this is actually world of warcraft and the difference between classic wow and retail wow and if you look over time, World of Warcraft kept adding things to make the game easier, right? It's like, here's Dungeon Finder and, you know, uh, streamlining quests and quest inspect and stuff like that. And over time, what that did is it, like, it took the excitement out of the game. It took the, like, it's not a deep game anymore out of the game. And a lot of people like Classic because it keeps all that stuff. And so... I think there are things we can do to make the game a little easier to understand, but we need to be careful that it doesn't just turn into you log in and buy all the, click all the units that are glowing and build your comp, right? Like that's not what we want to turn TFT into. We want to keep it a satisfying skill expressive thing that you think through. Now, again, there's a line, right? Like jungle timers were good for league. That's not, we don't need to not have jungle timers. But I do think, like, when I hear someone saying, hey, we add a thing where you buy one unit and now every unit that shares a trait is glowing, I get a little nervous. I get a little nervous. So, um, but then again, I've, I've always erred too much on the side of being conservative. Like, you're going to laugh. One of my dumbest mistakes, one of my dumbest mistakes is, you know the shop card glow? Where, like, let's say you have an Annie and another Annie appears in your shop and it's glowing. I was against that at first. I The way I said is, hey, there should be skill expression in rolling down and seeing the Annies. So let's only have the glow appear for the first three seconds. Or, like, after three seconds. So, like, if you let the shop sit there and three seconds later you don't notice the Annie, then it glows. And that was just that was just gatekeepy, and that's the wrong level of complexity. And no, the, the glow hasn't ruined the game. If I bought an Annie, I might want more Annies. Um, so I was wrong there. Another example of this is the, the carousel, for how long it took us to have the items pop off the carousel. Original uh, designer Mort would have said, no, no, there's a decision where sometimes you have to take the champion with the item on it, and that, that's a cool decision. No, the reality is it was an annoying decision. Nobody liked having to like lose a champion because the item was on the wrong character. So, yeah. I, I think there are definitely things we can do to help add these uh, extra assists. We just have to be careful of that line because I don't want to end up in a world where the game plays itself. Hey Mort, is the team going to make another trait like set 6, 6.5 Yordles? To me, it was the best beginner-friendly comp that got me hooked to TFT. Okay, so this is, a, this is a cool question. Because the answer is yes and no. We think Yordles was a big success as well in the access you're talking about, right? It was a very easy-to-play, friendly beginner trait that beginners love. A lot of people in set 6 would go, Hey, I want to play Yordles, and more Yordles would appear, and it was fun. It was great. Players loved Yordles. At the high level, Yordle was an incredibly toxic trait that basically was drip econ that everyone had to play every game. And if you didn't have a Yordle start, you were sad and you would just use it to econ. Um, we've actually been chasing trying to make another Yordle since Yordle. Uh, every, every set you can find that reroll trait that kind of is trying to be Yordles. But we haven't quite hit it as good as that OG Yordles. Set 9 was one of our worst. I, I think Set 9 Yordle was a big miss. It was a, a trait that you don't play till you're done with the trait. Um, Punk is trying to be this. Supers was trying to be this. So the answer is we're trying. We're actually trying to find something like Set 6, 6.5 Yordles that isn't also a disgusting economy trait that breaks the entire early game. It's been hard. Um, 
but I agree with your question that like, was it the best beginner friendly comp that got people hooked to TFT? Yeah, a lot. A lot of people feel the way you do. So, yeah. It's also, but here's the other hot take is because of that, what we've done every set now is every set we've made a, uh, a reroll trait. And my hot take from set 10 that I was sharing with the team is that I think that has been a mistake. I think an example of a good reroll trait was like Heart Lulu in set eight, because Heart Lulu was like, you bought a bunch of units, but you could also play these units in other traits. Whereas Punk, Punk feels like if you are not playing Punk, those four champions don't exist in the game. Like they, Those four champions are like, you play Punk or why would I ever buy a Twitch or a Jinx or anything like that? Um, I think that's really bad to have four champions that exist in such a silo that only play in one comp. Someone said Pantheon maybe. I have never seen anybody play Pantheon willingly other than like to activate Guardian for a second. So. Yeah. Anyway, there's that one. Oh, mods, you might want to get more picky with the questions or I'm never going to get through these. Uh, you mentioned that headliners make it so you can't hard force, but there are comps like Sentinel Ari where it doesn't matter what headliner you get as long as it fits the two traits you're playing. Doesn't this sort of hard force feel even more unhealthy than going into a game thinking I'm going KDA or true damage? Okay, I'm not following your... First off, you mentioned there are headliners... There are comps like Sentinel Ari where it doesn't matter as long as you get champions. Good. That's a good thing. Because if you if you can only play it when you hit exactly Headliner Ari, that's bad. We want you to have other options. Um, doesn't this feel more unhealthy than going into a game and thinking, I'm going KDA or True Damage? Why is that more unhealthy? I guess I'm not following the logic why that's more unhealthy. The comps wouldn't be seen by new players because verticals are easier to see. I mean, Six Sentinel is a vertical, so it's still a vertical. Why is Six Sentinel not a vertical? I don't know. Plus, I guess I'm not seeing, like, you're telling me you can't play KDA with KDA Chosen Seraphine? I don't know. I mean, if true, I guess that's just some balance numbers, but it's a question of how much the plus one trait matters and how much the uh, the bonus... Yeah, this is a weird question. Like, if you're telling me you can't play 7 KDA with a KDA Seraphine or a KDA Evelyn, I don't know. That doesn't seem true. If if that is true, that just means there's too much power in the, the, the headliner bonus. Getting the two-star is the big thing. That's still true of the Sentinel comp. Getting the free two-star Ari is very important in that comp. Getting the free two-star Blitzcrank is important. I don't know. I guess I'm not following the logic of this question. Sometimes it's a balance issue. Sometimes it's not. But the other thing I'll say is that a lot of the times, a lot of the things players say are musts aren't actually musts, and they don't understand why. The one that's been bugging me a lot lately is everyone's like, I got a true damage emblem. I must play Caitlyn. Why do you have to play Caitlyn? Well, because the guide says to play Caitlyn. Do you understand why you're playing Caitlyn? Do you understand why Caitlyn uses this emblem better than others? Or is it just, I'm following the guide? And so you see a lot of like the Twitch chatters will say really weird things where it's like, you got this emblem, you must play Caitlyn. It's like, but there's like six other options you could play. So, yeah. Ooh, here's a good question. Do you feel getting into competitive TFT is more difficult than other esports? It seems the barrier for entry into the competitive community, unless your master challenger is non-existent. This is a this is a weird question, and it's very interesting to me. So our goal, first off, let's talk about our goal. Our goal for TFT competitive is that it should be easier to get into than other games. Yes, you still need to be skilled at the game. That's going to be true of any game. I can't. I don't know that any game you can be competitive when you're not skilled, except for maybe fighting games. But even then, you just get O2'd every tournament. So 
I'm not sure I understand that, but we do want it. Like Vegas was a good example, right? Where anyone could buy a ticket to Vegas and you could play. And we had a master player reach top 32 or whatever. Like, so you can definitely play. That's our goal. But the other part here that I guess I'm not understanding is like, do you feel it's more difficult to get into? Have you seen trying to get into like a league team right now or a Valorant team or anything like that? Like, isn't the entire like tier two esports team community like falling apart right now? I I don't know, man. I feel like Pokemon competitive is the easiest to get into of any esport. Yeah, that's probably true. And I think Pokemon's actually a pretty good comparison, right? Where like I think TFT's trying to be kind of like Pokemon. Um though, man, Pokemon, the time to build those teams is insane. So, if anything, though, if Pokemon had a ranked ladder, you would just know... I guess maybe that's the trick, right? Is, like, if you look at games like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon, there's no ranked ladder to tell you before you even start that you're bad. You know? I guess, because even back when, like... I'm trying to think when I was, like, 18 and I wanted to play Pro Magic, I was like, this would be fun. And then I went to, like, two tournaments and realized how bad I was. So, I don't know. Is it more difficult than other esports? No, I guess I just don't agree with that. Like, trying to get into competitive league right now or Valorant, like, I don't know. So. Is there a good secret or way to get professional at this? Like, I want to be part of competitive, but I want to be good. I just don't want to play, like, waiting for luck. I mean, enter tournaments. That's really, it's about as that simple. It's enter tournaments. That's the big thing. Okay. Hey, Mort. As I understand, different servers have different strengths, metas, and understanding of the game. I'm curious, how often do the data from other servers improve the balancing of the game? So when we balance the game, we look at all the data together from all the different servers merged into one. Uh, because oftentimes, the differences in the servers are pretty minor and only really noticeable at the like challenger plus level um in the let's say you're at, like diamond or master the difference in the ladders are not going to be that different the problem is what happens is as you lower the number of players playing together you kind of get this like inherently closed off community and you see this a lot with like challenger in houses when pbe first comes out it's like a lot of people play the same way right one player one challenger player learns that open fording is the way to play he climbs the ranks the highest everyone copies that and all of a sudden you have a server where everyone is open fording even if that might not actually be the correct way to play i'm not saying it is or isn't i'm just saying it like it's like an echo chamber players in a small subset of players create an echo chamber but in somewhere like master that that it's so big that that echo chamber doesn't really happen and so the difference in servers is often those challenger echo chambers becoming what they are, right? The top China players all play one way. The top NA players all play another way. And that's also why some of the regional tournaments are the most fun is because we get to see a clash of those styles. We get to see which style actually matters. So it's basically everyone copying Dish Soap's homework. Yeah, basically. Basically, that's the way the NA server is right now, for sure. So, yeah. Uh, hey Mort, given the recent discussions on items and champions that certain influencers have been having, what are your thoughts on how certain players can heavily influence how persons view and play the game as one of the designers? I, uh, I mean, it is what it is. It's one of those things you can't ex like, you can't fight. Even if I thought it was a problem, let's pretend I was like, that's terrible. There's no way to fight it. Just like Asmund Gold influences WoW, even though he barely plays it. Just like whatever shooter influences shooters. People out there exist. The internet is the internet. You're not gonna you're not gonna stop it. So all you can do as the designer is focus on the truth and not also get influenced in those ways. Right? So like let's pretend for a minute a certain influencer says, I don't know, Ionic Spark is the worst item in the game. And maybe they just, they, they go on a rant and they tell everyone, 
Ionic Spark is the worst item in the game. And everyone starts parroting. Ionic Spark is the worst item in the game. Clearly, perception now is that Ionic Spark is the worst item in the game. But perception is only, as I've said, one third of the equation. That's when you would also dig into the data and really start understanding. Is Ionic Spark truly as bad as they say it is? Um, then you also go into designer intent. Is Ionic Spark behaving the way the designer wants it to? Is that design healthy? And again, I'm just using Ionic Spark as an example. But it's up to us to stay clear-minded and focused on, is this actually a problem? Does it need fixed? Does it need improved? And sometimes the answer is, yeah. You know, sometimes it is like, hey, we need to make this item better. Other times it's, no, they're just parodying it and it's doing what we need. And this set, we want it to do a particular thing. And so, but we can't really, like trying to fight influencers changing people's opinions, that's a... That's a pointless fight. We'll never win. We'd never win that fight. How do you balance keeping the wifey and family happy? You obviously work hard on TFT development, but also come home and play this game and stream it in your personal life. Does your family ever complain you spend too much time in this world versus theirs? So do you guys remember on the father-daughter stream where you guys asked my daughter what you would do and she said spend more time with me so like i'm definitely not perfect in this area for sure um but what i'll say is the best thing you can do is set very clear expectations uh one of the reasons why i stream on a very clear schedule every weekend is like hey i stream from 4 a.m to noon and then family has the time after and we've agreed to that we we have a clear agreement and as long as I follow that agreement, I'm good. Um, there are definitely days where I'm like, hey, I have to finish this patch. And my wife's like, ah, but I was hoping you would cook dinner. And it's like, can't this time. Sorry. But it is just, it's communication. It's communication and setting clear boundaries. And my wife knows I'm like very clearly setting the expectations. So, you know, I'll tell her like, hey, I've got this trip to Spain in November in two months. Just letting you know I'm going to be out of town for a week. Like... Yeah, so that's the that's the trick though. It's just being very clear. Is League down right now? How would I know? I'm sitting here answering questions. Turns out I don't actually on my desk have this thing that says server status of every server. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sitting here answering questions. How the frick would I know? <laughs> I'm just picturing every Riot employee with this watch that's like, warning, warning, NA servers are down. Stop what you're doing. Like, I, come on. Come on. How do you feel the addition of Emerald rank is working out? For me, I usually grind hard to master and then get burnt out and wait for the mid set. But Emerald has given me a pit stop to troll some games until I'm ready to commit to the grind again. Yeah, I don't know. So this is the kind of question where there's two different answers, right? There's me as a player and there's me as a uh, designer. Me as a designer? I don't know yet. It's too early to tell. I think Emerald Rank's only been around like a month, so it's hard to tell. From what I can tell, the challengers barely noticed it existed. They just kind of moved on. Uh, then there's me as a player. What I'll say is my perception as a player, as a master's player normally, is that it kind of annoyed me. It was like an extra stop and made it, t it, made it feel longer. Um, but again, that's different than designer. Is it serving the needs that that team wanted? I don't know yet. I'm actually very curious myself. So I've, I've been finding it, I don't know, a little grindy personally, but we'll see. We'll see. Hey, Mort, what are your thoughts in making items more flexible, all benefiting AD and AP, and more general tank items? Do you think the item component system still works after 10 sets? Oh, this is a this is an interesting question that, like, man, you ask Leduck and he'll tell me we've ruined TFT. Um, so there are two ends of the spectrum, okay? When you're talking about the item system, there's the everything is homogenous system. And the extreme version of this is... Imagine if every damage item just said, you do 30% more damage. Blue buff, you do 30% more damage. Red buff, you do 30% more damage. Infinity edge, you do 30% more damage, right? Um, in this world, every item works on every champion. 
Easy. Easy to balance. Great. Obviously boring as shit. Very, very boring. On the other end of the spectrum, we have, uh, you know, the items that only work on one champion, right? This is like Hurricane when it procced on hits, only good on Vayne. And it's like, yeah, there were some really cool combinations, but basically, you know, it was very narrow. We ended up with these like, well, you only play this champion with this item. We've been having trouble finding where on that spectrum we're supposed to be. I believe it is closer to the homogenous thing, right? Like giving blue buff AD, for example, I think was very good for the game. I think that patch where we gave blue buff AD, good stuff. All of a sudden, Kaisa liked it. Ezreal liked it. There were more champions you could play the item on. I think that's good. But I know players like Leduc have just been like, well, every item is now just a boring stat stick that every champion can use. And that's made the game worse. It's less interesting. And neither is necessarily right or wrong. It's a question of choice intentions. My belief is that the, the core item component system, the system where you just get random items and have to play what you're hit with, is you know, not supposed to be where you put the interesting stuff. It's supposed to be, hey, kind of play around this as much as you can. This is why I mentioned earlier that I think the artifact space is where we can be much more interesting because artifacts are something you opt into. Um, we can find more ways to give you artifacts, but I think that's where we can do a lot more of the spicy stuff. So I think that's, Right now, I know both myself and Alex are looking at that artifact system going, how can we get a lot of that spice back in TFT? Because I agree, if every item is just plus 30% damage, the game's boring too, right? So, and that's been the trick. It's been trying to find where on that spectrum we're supposed to be. Now I say, by the way, when I say artifacts too, I'd say that not with the current artifact distribution. If you only see an artifact once every four games, that's not the answer either. So, but like a dumb example might be what if, and again, I'm making this up. This is all fake. This is not something we're shipping, but like what if 60% of your games, the stage, stage five dragon was an artifact or obviously with that, you might say, Hey, that's too late. Um, or what if every dumb version is like, 60% of your games, stage three, everyone gets an artifact anvil. You know, stuff like that can be pretty interesting. So, anyway, that's my current thought, though. Wait, this is the same question. <laughs> I mean, this is basically the same question. Mods, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hey Mort, what are your thoughts on the current state of items? Do you think it's just a matter of adjusting numbers at this point or do you anticipate more item reworks in the future? I think at this point, most of the items, the core items are working. I think it's just numbers. Um, I think any of the items that are currently not popular are very easy to make popular with just a few extra stats. I keep going back to that Ionic Spark example. I think if Ionic Spark had 300 HP on it, no one would complain. Everyone would be like, Ionic Spark's great. I love Ionic Spark. It just doesn't because it's weak. So I don't know. I don't see many more base item reworks in the future. I think we're good for a while. Uh, what is your biggest next project dream for TFT, assuming infinite time and resources? Uh, is there a way I can answer this without without saying anything that might be coming up is what is your biggest next project dream? My biggest next project dream. Okay. This is assuming infinite time and resources would be a way to make Vegas happen, but with like 20 times the people and you do the first 19, like the first 90% of it online. That would be my infinite dream. Yeah. But again, that's infinite time and resources. That's not something that's realistically happening. How do 
does the team gauge the reception of TFT first exclusive skins like this sets Lulu, Lilia, and Alawi? Um, well, it's interesting. You mentioned how do we gauge the reception? It always goes back to anytime you're creating anything, like I said, the question is what is the goal, right? Why did we create these exclusive skins? Well, we created these exclusive skins to give ourselves tanks in the verticals and things like that and make a coherent set. So when we gauge how that went, we care about did it accomplish the goal? Did these skins make a more cohesive set? Yes, they did. They did. We did exactly what they needed to do. So that's what we care about mostly. And so that goes great. Now, do players like them? It wasn't really the primary goal. Nice bonus. If players like those skins, cool. Do players like the Alawi skin? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think that's a question for our insights team to kind of do player surveys and figure out and see if players really like those skins. Um, I think League also is watching and paying attention to that because if players really like those skins, maybe they poured them over, maybe not. But again, the primary goal was focus on making our, our game more coherent. So, yeah. Uh, hey, Mr. Big Beard, just purely hypothetical because I know you're not allowed to join tournaments. Would like to test your skills with TFT pros in a game tournament? I would love to. The few times I've gotten to play with other pros, it's fun. Competing in TFT is so fun. If you guys remember, I can think of two times I've gotten to compete. Do you remember there was that PBE tournament we did with like Soju and Fluffy and a few others? We did that PBE tournament one time because I was trying to test some changes on one of the patches. It was like a leveling tournament. We were, we were testing something. And I had we played. Soju won the tournament. I took second. I remember that. Um, but it was just fun to play with them and prove that I could hold my medal against them. Um, I forget exactly what it was. The Tom Kench Cup. Oh, yeah. The Tom Kench Cup was fun. That was a good one, too. Um... And then there was the uh, the pre-show at Vegas, but that was more of a for fun thing. That being said, how good do I actually think I am? I mean, not that good. I think I'm okay. I I would say I'm a little worse than Soju, <laughs> and Soju is not the best challenger player out there right now either. He's good but I'm a lot worse than, say, dish soap. <laughs> I'm a lot worse than dish... Easily top 1%. I agree with that. I am easily top 1%. <laughs> That's true. Hey, Mort, are there dedicated UX research and design teams for TFT? If so, how big are they and what important questions do they tackle? Yes. Yes, there is. Um... Uh, we have Alicia has been our longest term dedicated UX designer. I think we're now at like five or six UX designers. Um, and as far as what questions do they tackle? Uh, the two main things are the outside of game experience as far as like, you know, anything that's going on. This could be a mode this or a, an event screen, stuff like that. But also the in-game uh, where things are. For example, if we want to do headliner, the UX designer is like, how do we communicate to the player which trait is plus one? They work with a lot of our visual designers to make sure all of that information is clear. Where does it need to show up? Uh, how does it fit on mobile as well? Things like that. Um, so that's the big thing they work on. Um, yeah. The way, I, the way I always work with the UX is like, we want to do a thing. Here's kind of how I would do it. And I'll give them an idea of like, okay, if we're going to do headliners... You probably need this and this and this. And then they take it and crank it from a 7 to a 10. They'll like, oh, you forgot about this. You didn't think about this. And this will look even better. Um, so they'll make it even better from there. So. How much do you think about player burnout from set to set when you determine each set's success? As an example, I loved the last set and played a lot, and now I've barely touched the current set because I need a break to play other games. That's okay. So 
I guess the question is how much do we think about player burnout from set to set like what you're describing? I would say not a lot because the case for every player like you that's maybe taking a break, there's another player that might be coming back. So we have to look at it in the aggregate of like how much their total is. So essentially what we look at is like total player numbers, right? How many people are playing the set? How many games those players are playing? Uh, you know, for example, if these are fake numbers, fake numbers, I'm going to use insanely fake numbers here so that no one gets confused. Um, but let's say set nine, the average player played 82 games and set 10, the average player played 92 games. That would be a thing. Um, but also average can mean something very different, right? It could be in set uh, nine, the average player who played more than 50 games played 100 games. But in set 10, the average player who played more than 50 play games only played 90 games. Like, that's what I mean. Like, you can look at this data and determine a bunch of different things based on it. But the, the shortest version is how many players are playing and are they playing a lot of games? That's, that's the shortest version. Holiday could also skew the numbers. Yes, Generic Bird actually brings up a really good point. Because sometimes you can't compare set to set like that. Uh, if you compare set 9 to set 10, that might tell you one thing. But the other thing it might tell you is that set 9 was in summer and set 10 was in winter. So some, in, in other ways, if you compare set 8 to set 10, now you get a winter to winter set. And that tells you a different thing. You know, and so because a lot of the time some of these variances could just be like, other games came out in com com competing spaces. It had nothing to do with what you did. And that's why this can be so challenging for a lot of our insights people. It's like the actual causality of the impact of things could be all sorts of things, right? And again, fake numbers. But let's say set 10 was worse than set 8. It's not, but let's say it was. That could actually just be nothing to do with the set. And it could be with covid and people having less time to play games or not, you know, like finding the causality of what's actually causing these things is really interesting. A lot of players, you know, if you believe Reddit, it's like, well, it's because the balance is bad. No. Um, the best example of this is always Earth, right? Where it's like players always talked about how whenever Earth shut off, player numbers would go down in league. And then later we figured out it was because there were Korean holidays. Coincidentally, every time we turned off Earth, it's like, crazy things like that that just make it really hard sometimes so the way i think about this is rather than stress about all these causes and things that affect player numbers just make the best game you can and players will come that's it so Sometimes I stream TFT and Discord, and my friends who do not ca play casually remark that they don't even know what they are looking at, and it just doesn't make sense at all, unlike, say, an FPS or a fighting game. Is this a thing you think about as a team when discussing how to get new players? Yes and no. I really hate comments like that personally, because with anything, literally anything, if you don't know what's going on with it and you try to watch it, it's hard to get into. If you watch a baseball game, do you know what's going on? Not really. But you can learn it. Um, you said, unlike an FPS or fighting game, yeah, there are certain games that have such copies of each other that, yes, any first-person game, it's like, yes, shoot person. Yeah, sure, great. Um, but is this a new thing you and the team think about when discussing how to get new players? The problem is, let's assume it was. I'm not saying it is, but let's, let's pretend you came up to me and you said, Mort, this is a thing. What would the solve be, right? Like, hey, we need viewers to understand this more without ever having played the game. Is that a condition you want us making a game around? Is a condition, hey, someone who's never seen this game before in this genre that's relatively unexplored needs to understand the game while watching it. I don't know that you could even do that. So... Big pop-ups to explain it. Yeah, see that? Yeah, that's just terrible. So, I don't know. And what I'll say is, I've watched a lot of Marvel vs. Capcom with my wife on Evo. And 
she doesn't really understand what's going on either, other than guys are hitting each other and someone dies eventually. So, I don't know. I don't know that that's our condition, but... What I also say, though, is that we're kind of lucky, because once you do at least understand a little, TFT is very fun to watch. And that's been one of our design pillars, is that TFT should be fun to watch. And I think it's, like, it's very fun to watch when you know what you're doing. Like, even if you don't know what you're doing, it's just kind of nice to see. And let's be real, games 4, 5, and 6 of Vegas... Oh, chef's kiss. Games 4, 5, and 6 of Vegas that day were some of the most fun TFT of all time, man. Woo! So... Oh, this is a fun question. Why do you think a lot of players' influencers are so anti-reroll comps? I find playing a reroll comp based off what I get very fun and flexible. This is a great question. I think it's funny because if you look at the five costs of champions, right? One cost, two cost, three cost, four cost, five cost. I bet you, you could find uh, a group of players that love each cost and hate the others, right? There are players that love one cost and hate four and five costs. There are players that love three costs and hate one cost. There are players that love four and five costs and hate one cost. It's like they want to play the game they want to play and don't like the way other people play the game. And it's funny because if you watch any meta, any meta, this set is so well balanced. And I have seen people be like, Annie is bad. It's just reroll. Caitlyn is bad. It's just four cost lottery. Ziggs is bad. It's just five cost. Run to rush to the five. Like, there's this weird, like, all you do is, like, Yone. You just, you just re-roll Yone. Like, I, I don't know how to describe it other than people like to just complain about the thing they don't like to do and try to talk down to it to somehow make themselves feel better. And it's very weird and very unhealthy. But what I've also learned over the years is I can't be the therapist for every player out there and try to teach them to get over that. I, I, I would go crazy trying to solve that. All I can do is make sure the game is fun and hope players play around that. So, but there there is, like I said, no matter what cost is meta and what's going on, people will complain about it. And I don't know how to solve that. And I think it would be a waste to try to solve that. So... Uh, I always see survey questions about the game being too slow, but I personally have always felt it goes too fast compared to past sets. Would there ever be a game mode and or balancing that addresses something like this? Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by too slow or too fast. The problem is conventional game design knowledge right now says that a 40 minute game that's on mobile is a bad idea, right? Um, you look at games like, I don't know, I'll just pick Marvel Snap randomly. It's like players want short games that they can consume very quickly. TikTok, right? It's, it's the TikTok generation. It's the consume things quickly and everything says things should be fast, should be fast, should be fast. Um, Wild Rift sped up League. Sure, that's a good example. Um, but what I'll say is that I don't agree with this. I personally think that for people who like games and want to get into games deeply... They want the 100-hour, the 500-hour experience. They don't want things to be over quick. I think one of my biggest problems with, I won't mention game names, but some of the competing products I've seen in our space is that after like 10 games, I'm like, I've seen it all. You know, I'm not looking for something to consume and be done with. I want something that I can like stick with and play. Um, so, I don't know. Is there any balancing that would address this? I, I, I don't know. What I'll say is I'm pretty happy with our 30 to 40 minute game time. And if someone came to me today and said shorten it, I'd go no. And if they said long it, I'd go no. Unless there's a really good reason. So. Seeing a dev be so involved with streaming the game, such as yourself, from a fan perspective is a massive pro. 
There's many other games that could benefit from this and they may have it, I'm just unaware. Is there or was there any concerns initially with you doing this and is there any negatives to it even now? Oh yes, there's a lot here. I've broken this down before in the past, but uh, okay, to answer your question specifically, is there or was there any concerns initially with you doing this? Yes, absolutely. Um, with any dev streaming, we have a whole thing you have to go through. It's like, hey, you're speaking as yourself, be careful. But like, you know, especially the more high profile you get, the things you say have a lot of weight. And I've screwed this up a couple times, but it's like, you have to be really careful with things you say. Um, hell, even recently, within the last six months, I will say, I have said a comment that had our comms guy come to me and be like, Mort, don't be saying that. That's messed up. You can't say that. Um, because again, I'm a representative of a company. And so there's a lot of pressure there. There's a, there's a, a trust, right? Where they're like, they're letting me go out and say things. Because again, I'm saying things that are my opinion, right? And I'm pretty open and honest, right? If I think we're doing something silly, I'll, I usually say it. Um, but you also don't want to throw like your coworkers under the bus or anything like that. So there's definitely a lot of concerns. Um, are there any negatives to it? Oh yeah, a lot of negatives as well. Uh, I mean, ignoring the like, because again, the other thing I said before is like, Riot pays me to be a good game designer. That's what they care about. That's what they pay me for. They don't pay me to cast tournaments. They don't pay me to stream the game on the weekend. That's not something they want me doing. And if my streaming and casting was getting the way of being a good game designer, they would tell me to stop that because my primary job is be a good game designer. So um, you could argue that hypothetically, if I was doing this wrong, it could be a negative on that. So... Those incidentals end up helping your game design though. Yeah, that's my belief, which is one of the reasons why I do it. Uh, I think being this invested in the space makes me a better game designer, but yeah, I, I just, it's hard to find somebody that is willing to do this in their extra time that is not work time. So, but I don't know. I would like to think that Riot looks at what I do and thinks it's a positive. I would like to think that, and I've been told that by some people. I've been told by others that it's not. Um, there are some rioters that probably look at what I do with disdain. So, but I don't know. I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. What, what did uh, what did Miles say? I'm gonna do my own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, Mort, just came up to the stream. Don't know if you will answer this. Will there be any changes to chances for Chosen? I was many times in situations that I got a spat in late game or emblem on carousel, and I can't find a Chosen of five cost on nine and a four cost at that time because most of them are taken away. So if there was any change to make, I don't know when or if we can make this. There's one change I would make. Uh, and it's not the five cost on nine. We added that rule where if half the champions were out of the pool, they couldn't show up as a headliner. This was to combat three stars because this there became this strategy where you hit six Zacks, then you sell your headliner and roll for headliner Zack. And that's how you would get a three star Zack. Uh, it was too good. So we last minute added that rule. And I think it was a good rule to save that system, but it became unintuitive and I think that rule should have just been if you own half of them, not if they're half are gone. So if you own six Zacks, you can't find a headliner Zack, but not. And so that would be the one change I would consider. I'd want to test it because what I don't want is the strategy to be, well, find five Zacks and then do it. But I think then at least if two other players are playing headliner Ari, you could find a headliner Ari and that might be okay, you know? So that'd be the one change. But again, don't know when or if we're gonna be able to do it, but I would consider that change. Would it be possible, could it be a good idea to have an option to always use default skins and shop portraits to prevent ease confusion of different skins between sets? So this question comes up a lot. And I think there's a really good example right now um, 
Is it true? What? Okay, I shouldn't read chat. Chat, there's some bad first time chatters. Uh, would it be possible, could it be a good idea to have an option to always use default skins and shop portraits to prevent ease of confusion? So this question comes up every time we use a set with skins. Clearly from people who like League, um, but don't want to like learn the skins. But I think there's a really good skin line in this set that really proves that theory. When we pick the skin lines to make a cohesive origin, we're usually trying to make the colors and splashes align. If you look at EDM, right, you have Jax, Lux, Zed, and Zac. These four champions, all darker, black, purple, whatever, and they all look really good together. It's like, if I'm playing EDM, buy all of those skins, the Empyrean skins, yep. I think if they had default skins, the game gets more confusing. Hey, you're playing EDM, so buy purple Jax, white Lux, uh, green Zack, and red Zed? What? They have, like, no cohesion. And yeah, they're in their plain skins, but, like, how does that help you? Right? Like, a lot of the times with our Origins, we're just like, buy all, like, you're playing Void last set. Buy all the purple champs. You'll be fine. But, yeah, I just, I think with the base skins, it'd be really bad. Perhaps base skins with chromas? Then at that point, what are we solving? What are we solving? So, I don't know. I think skins are what they are. There are, there are always going to be people that are more familiar with League, that don't like the skins. But it is what it is, and I think we have to uh, stick with it. So... What are your thoughts on headliner mechanic without a plus one trait bonus? So it does one thing immediately negative, which is there's just less options, right? Um, without the plus one trait, you're just, there are now 59 headliners instead of 118, which is less for, less good for variants. It's simpler, um, but I don't know. The plus one trait is kind of the fun part of it. It's like you can opens up new ways to build, right? Where it's like, Ah, now that I hit this headliner, I can play this comp I, I don't normally. Whereas instead, now it just becomes, which champ do I want a free two-star? So my initial reaction to that is it's, like, more boring. Um, easier to balance, for sure, but it's a lot more boring, I'd say. So, yeah, I like Heartsteel, <laughs> Heartsteel Cassante, I buy. Perfect. Agree, agree. Hey Mort, what is your current thinking on low skill expression reroll comps versus end game four and five cost boards that require constant shifts in your board? I've seen the former beat the latter so many times, and it always feels like players aren't rewarded enough for that end game skill expression. So we answered this about 30 minutes ago, but clearly we have a player here who believes that low cost champions are inherently low skill expression. What is it that makes Annie low skill expression other than the fact she's a one cost and you don't like her? I do not believe Annie is low skill expression. I think there are great ways to play Annie. Um, the other thing that you're doing is you're you're doing another thing that really gets really reductive and really lame is you're looking at the carry and you're being, their comp is Annie. No, their comp is not Annie. Their comp is Annie and some frontline and some supporting champions and things like that. Uh, it just happens Annie is the one outputting damage. Um, Annie right now, I think, hot take for anyone who doesn't like this, Annie is in a very good state. Annie is in a very healthy state. She's a good champion. She's one of the few reroll comps that work without breaking the meta. She's not even an S tier comp. She has good combat pacing. Annie's in a great spot. The one game she won at Vegas required perfect augments and even then it was close. Um, Malala, you know, the, the learn to spell Annie. So there are going to be reroll comps in our game. So, and if you don't like that, I get it, but stop calling it low skill because for every person who says there's a low skill reroll comp, there's going to be someone else who says a low skill, just econ level to eight and buy all the four and five costs. Look at me. I'm high skilled. See, I can be reductive also. It's not healthy all the comps can be good 
Stop worrying about if something is reroll or not. Play a comp, play the game well, play the game you want to play, and win. That's it. Get over it. <laughs> with the great variety of little legends and respective animations, is there any chance that they will become part of the game with their respective origins and traits? We've talked about this briefly. Trust me, many times some designer has been like, what if we put Pengu in the set as a unit? Um, I think for clarity, though, we want to keep that line pretty distinct. So I would say right now the odds are pretty low against it. But trust me, it, it comes up, I would say, once a year at least. Someone being like, cool. Um, I think there have been things we've done that kind of show some of this, though. Remember putting Elder Dragon in set seven? Like, I think, I think there's room for things other than champions. So... But I, I don't know that Little Legends are the way to go. And I certainly wouldn't put Chibi Champions in. Jinx versus Chibi Jinx in the same set. Let's go. Is there a way to display the potential headliner bonus of a unit in your shop prior to purchasing? I'm deep in Emerald at this point. I still don't always know the bonuses available to me. So... We debated this and ended up deciding to not display it, to not make the tooltip more complicated. But I guess my question to you is, what would change if you knew the answer? If you knew that uh, Aphelios' headliner bonus was 20 AD, how does that change your decision making in any way? That's the thing that made us go, we don't really need to show this, is they don't actually change anything. There's no, there's no point where you're like, I was going to play Aphelios, but because I found out his headliner bonus was AD, I wasn't going to. That, that, that's not really a realistic scenario. It helps for talent search? No, it doesn't. Even for talent search, you just assume your champion got some extra stats. That's it. Whether that stat is AD or health changes very little. Very little. Units like Bard with like unique effects, the few that we have, it shows it for talent search. Yeah, but not before you make the decision, but that's just it, it doesn't really matter. So, yeah. It's one of those things that again, like the information part of your brain says, I want to know everything, so put it all in the tooltip. But we've kept the tooltip simple because lowering, um, lowering the information burden of information that actually matters was important so okay we're hitting some repetitive questions here uh, i know this is the first instance of no mid set what do you guys have planned to keep the game fresh i think after a few weeks tft does get very stale especially once you've tried all the comps and augments unless you are competitive it seems like now you just stop playing for several months if that ends up being true that will be a problem uh, that being said, we have an old set revival coming up soon. Um, I would hope some things we're adding could make sense. 14.1 is adding a bunch of new portals. There's a bunch of new portals that'll be pretty exciting. So we'll keep adding things. Um, but if you're already burned out after a month, I think that speaks more to a, a bigger TFT problem that, I don't know, I hope isn't true though. I don't know that I'm agreed with. Are you, have you actually played everything in, in set 10 already? Seems questionable. But then again, maybe you already played like 300 games. I don't know. But like I said, our plan is to add some more stuff. So it just won't be a full mid set. That's all. All right. How does the team feel about the identity of frontline tanks? I feel the game has found a cool place for the existence of AD casters and AP carries breaking the mold, but frontline has lacked the same diversity for a while, especially with the tra lack of traits like Mystic and Defender. Okay, that, that turn took a weird curveball. Why are Mystic and Defender frontline identity? That's weird. But um, what I'll say is we definitely have struggled a little bit. Uh, a lot of the times the set designers are like, I'm tired of making every tank heal myself, shield myself, gain a bunch of armor and MR. Because um, that's basically what tanks tanks need to live, right? The job of a tank is to stand there and live. Um, the one exception is CC, 
I either live or I apply CC and it's been hard to find things that aren't that for sure. Um, but that's where I think having the secondary output of damage can be pretty unique. This is why I wish Mordekaiser Headliner worked a lot better. Um, cause having Mordekaiser also do damage is kind of fun. So I don't know. Otherwise I guess I don't understand the rest of the question. The lack of traits like Mystic or Defender. Mystic and Defender were not really interesting identities, but I don't know. Uh, da, 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 da. If you could say from what you have seen this set, who will you put in the top best unit and the bottom of the worst unit? From a design standpoint? I want to look at the list so I don't forget anybody. Stats. Okay. Worst unit. Probably Krogus. See, see, people are saying Vi. Vi is just power, but Vi is just Bonky Kong. Vi is literally the same spell as Bonky Kong. You up that damage, no one's going to complain about Vi. I'm talking about design. Gragas is like, heal a bit, then do an AoE explosion that's barely readable. But the heal's flat, so like, eh. Zed would also be really high on that list for me. Zed is like, make clones that you can barely see happening, and then the random X happens but you have no idea why. So Zed would be pretty high on that list for me. As far as bad goes. As far as good goes, I'm a big fan of Yorick. The summoning zombies I think we did in a really cool way. Um, so Yorick would be pretty high on my list. Poppy I actually think ended up pretty fun. Like the, the rapid hammer slam is a really cool way to be tanky. Although Poppy wouldn't end up very high on that list because... A lot of people thought Poppy was a carry. <laughs> Poppy's supposed to be a tank. Um, Twisted Fate's pretty cool. Twisted Fate's a very visually nice spell and a cool redo of the four cost Kaisa. So. Bard would also be really low on my list. Bard is a champion that randomly says, randomly heal or do damage. By the way, every time you heal, be very sad. Like, so Bard would be pretty low on my list too. Like, if I could cut the heal from Bard's spell, I would. And I'd be happy. I hate that heal. So, there you go. Uh, hey, Mort, can you break down orb drops from the first creep round? I often see you predict what you will receive on 1-4 and was wondering how. Thank you. Yeah. So, every player gets the same value of starting orbs which is essentially for for sh the short version i'll call it three three medium and two small okay so every player gets three blue orbs and two uh two small orbs minimum from there the base version is three items from those three blue orbs uh item 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 and then uh, the six gold. Okay. So it's like three items and six gold. Every time you don't get an item, you're going to get another six gold. So instead of three items and six gold, you might get two items and 12 gold or one item and 18 gold. Okay. But everyone gets the same thing as far as like that value. So when you hear someone say they got a gold start, what they actually got was two items and 12 gold or... Uh, one item and 18 gold. Um, so all you have to do is like, what is not left when you get to that last round? Now, someone in chat just asked, there is one other variation of this, which sometimes instead of three items and six gold, it's five items and six gold. That is one special variation. Uh, other than that, the same rules still apply. So when it's five items and six gold, uh, it could be four items, 12 gold, three items, 18 gold. It can't be two items, 24 gold. That's not a thing. 
Um, now, someone just said, what about Nico start? So the way duplicators work is duplicators count as gold. That's all they are. They're just gold. And Demacian Raptor just said it in chat. A small Nico is two gold. A big Nico is three gold. That's it. They just come from your gold orb. So instead of your three item, six gold, you might get three item, three gold plus duplicator. But as long as you can keep that in your head, which is pretty simple, um, that's how I can usually predict. So it's like, for example, if we're going into one four and I've already gotten three items and three gold, well, the only thing left is three more gold. So here comes three more gold. Easy. Is there a four item six zero gold? Nope. Nope. You always get at least six gold. And you'll always get at least three of that gold on one two from the first thing you kill. So. Okay, this is a really good question. It's They're being funny, but it's a good question. Hey, Mort, I have a question about questions. I've been watching videos like from Galaxies Onwards, and you get asked the same questions there as you do now. How does that make you feel? So the honest answer is a little sad because, like, there's this weird sort of, like, it's not Dunning-Kruger, but there's another name for it where it's, like, I've been sharing all this knowledge for four years, but, you know, some people just join. Some people have been watching the whole time. I think some of my mods have it hardest because they've been listening and paying attention for all these e these years. But then you get the person who's like just starting their TFT journey, just starting their Mort stream journey. And they want to ask all these same questions that you've answered over the years. And so it does end up getting a little repetitive and, you know, and you're like, but I've even put all the resources out there that they could watch. Um, hell, I mean, even today we got like questions that I answered 30 minutes ago, you know? So... And it's one of those things that can make it feel like you're not growing. Like this is true of like coworkers, right? If like, if I explain a thing to a coworker and then six months later, explain it to a new coworker, does my job just become explaining that same thing over and over? If so, what am I doing? Right? Like, cause as humans, we just want to inherently keep growing and chasing new knowledge and getting better. And we can't do that if we're just answering the same questions over and over. So, but then obviously everyone's going to point out the stuff like they're new people, they want to learn. And it's true, you do. And so that's why you keep doing it. So, but yeah, maybe you weren't expecting a serious answer on that one, but there you go. Uh, okay, this is a fun one that I'm not equipped to answer, but I'm going to answer. Does Riot have a plan to support more grassroots community events? I love organizing TFT tournaments, but it takes a lot out of us monetarily. So I'm not an expert in this space. I probably don't have a good answer for this. You should ask someone like Boise's. But I think the whole point of grassroots community events is that they are inherently grassroots and not bound by the, the parent company. You know, I think Smash being supported by Nintendo like, I don't know. I don't know what kind of support you'd need. It's like the tournaments are run, right? Like, we've run tournaments for us. Like, what are, what are we looking for, you know? Like, because if it's just money, the answer is probably not, right? Because the money has to have some sort of return on investment. It's like, I remember early on in TFT, there were a lot of people in Lobby 2 especially that would be like, I just demand higher prize pools. And it's like, why what's the motivation for riot to like just crank out these prize pools uh like social media support and exposure yeah that one that one can help i don't know that one's always a tricky part of like how do you put all the information out there without an influx of information one of the scariest things you can do is like it's like imagine if i tweeted 10 times a day the value of each tweet goes down right it's just an inherent information overload so that one's always tricky. Yeah, then I'd be a farming tweet. <laughs> so I guess to, 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 to go back to your question rather than getting all philosophical about it, does Riot have a plan to support more grassroots? I don't know. My honest answer is probably not. I don't know for sure though. But what I'll say personally is I'm happy to support them in any way I can. I like grassroots community events. They're fun. Things like Fight Night were really fun. So, but yeah, it's hard because being a tournament organizer 
is a very hard thing. I have a lot of appreciation for the people who do it. Hey Mort, I've been wondering for a while why ever since Academy Lux, you've been experimenting with different types of four cost AP carries instead of cross map one shot. What is the reason and how has it been working out? Uh, I mean, it goes back to variety, right? Like if every four cost carry is one shot, then they get boring. So we need to come up with new types. If every set had the exact same archetype of champions, the game gets really boring. So I think Ari is a good example in this set where it's like, what happens if we have a single target four cost AP, AP carry? Can that work? Um, you know, even during development, a lot of people were like, Ari's broken because she two shots a carry and it's like, or a tank. And it's like, well, yeah, she has to because she's single target and slow. So it's tricky, but we need variety and variety is the big thing here. So. Okay, this is a fun question. Very simple one. Hey, Mort, do you like how the bag size changes are impacting the game thus far? Okay, so this is a tricky question because first off, when we talk about the bag size changes, one of the things that comes up, and this happened even during development, is a lot of people will attribute things to the bag size that have nothing to do with the bag size. I didn't hit my carry. Must be the bag size's fault. No, you just didn't hit. We've seen many games on stream where it's like, yeah, I didn't hit my RE2 on my roll down, but it had nothing to do with the bag sizes. I wasn't contested. I just didn't hit. That's how random distribution works. So one of the things we have to be careful with is to stop talking about the bag size. Like basically the bag size has become this thing people point to when they didn't hit and it's dumb and I hate it. Um, so it makes it really hard to have good conversations about the bag size changes. That being said, let's talk about the actual impact and things it did do. One of the things it did do was, you know, you'd get those screenshots from people on Reddit that would be like, top four all played this comp and all top four game balance is bad, right? Because it's a draft game. And, you know, if four people are all playing the same comp, they're supposed to do worse. But the reality is it didn't matter because the bag sizes were not that small. And we're seeing less of those screenshots. So, if TFT is supposed to be a draft game, the bag size changes are doing their job. We're definitely seeing a lot less of, I saw four people all playing RE Sentinel and they all top forward. Good. That's a good thing. So again, if TFT is supposed to be a draft game, the bag change did their job. The other thing is that we have data. The other thing the bag size changes were trying to do was lower the number of three star four costs and five costs. And we have data that proves that that worked. We got them down to the numbers we wanted to because if three star four and five costs are rare, we can keep them exciting and strong. And that's been good. We can do that. Cool. So again, to the goal, uh, it's been working. I actually had a game with three RE top four. Yeah, you had three, not four. So it's helping. Um, but that's why that goes back to that original question of is TFT supposed to even be a draft game? That's the more interesting discussion, right? Because if it is, I think the bag size changes have been successful, but it's very clear. There are a lot of casual players that want to like log in for sorry and be told that's fine. And they don't want to like, or an another really good example is like, let's say you start the game. And the first thing in your shop is an Annie headliner and three Annies. And you get a, a Shoujin. The game is basically saying, you should play Annie, right? And you're like, cool, I'm going to adapt and I'm going to play Annie. But what you don't know is someone else in the game also had the exact same thing. And now all of a sudden you're both at a disadvantage for something that neither of you had control over, right? Someone said, yeah, just scout dented. Yeah, it's like, because two of you happened to pick Annie, you're now just worse off for no reason. What's the play? Is one of you supposed to pivot? Not really. The game's kind of telling you, right? And so this is the kind of fundamental discussion that, like, TFT's at a crossroads to really figure out. And so, and again, that has nothing to do with bag size changes. That was true before the bag size changes. It's just now they're a little bit more impactful. So again... If TFT is a draft game, 
bag size change is good, but is TFT a draft game? Question mark. Big question mark. So, because if it's not a draft game, then there's just eight Annie players because Annie's OP. But no, Annie's not OP. That was a joke. How often do you have a very fun idea for a champ or trait design but can't ship because of balance issues? Not that often. Again, like this is the kind of question where it's like you want the person to get more educated because you can't ship it because of balance issues. What balance issue would stop us from shipping a thing? Balance issue sounds like this buzzword that you can just say of like problematic, but like a balance issue is just too strong, too weak. Like, everything is balanceable. Yes. Everything is balanceable to some extent. Um, so. Yeah. But I guess not often is the honest answer. Wait, 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 wait. This is a, okay. This is a wrong take question. Has there been any thought discussion about making even shroud an item more equivalent to spark? There is a feeling that building spark shiv is a 50 50, whereas a last whisper is almost always built over even shroud with the later being a worse scenario for Sunder. Uh, so this is where I feel like your understanding of current TFT is, is wrong and you are missing critical information. Um, even Shroud is really considered a very good item right now. Um, Last Whisper is not being built right now. It has in previous sets, which is interesting because Last Whisper's stats are actually quite good. Shiv and Spark are both not being built right now because there's so much shred from other sources. And Spark is considered one of the worst items in the game right now. Um, all of that still being said, I think our goal is to make it so that as long as you have one of these items, you're fine. We want them all, to, like, as long as you have a spark or a shiv, you're good. If you have an even shroud or a whis last whisper, you're good. Um, so, you know, right now, I don't think, like, I think last whisper and even shroud are in a good spot. I think spark and shiv need a little love. And I think part of this is, like, Ziggs is 30% shred when he should be 20%. There might be one other one I'm thinking of, but yeah. So. But yeah, it's interesting that you had that opinion considering it's just not the actual current case right now. So. This is a good one. How have you felt the partnering with streamers like Boxbox Box Bootcamp benefit the game, or are they just more of a fun thing to do? So, I can only speak as a, like, player, because um, I don't actually have the insights data on what these actual impact are. My guess is the actual impact is pretty small, but I do think it's very fun. I think getting people to be interested in the first two weeks of TFT and, like, compete are pretty cool. I think as a game designer, there are things I would like adjust, right? It's like people get knocked out real fast in those things. And, you know, you have to play a lot of games that first two weeks. But I think I think it's really cool what BoxBox Box and Riot have partnered to do with those. So as a player, I think they're awesome. I think BoxBox Box Bootcamp has been great. I think we should do more of that stuff. It's a really hype community event. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. So make it not only an A. I agree. I agree. So I agree. I think they're I think they're sweet. I don't, like I said, I don't know if the like money spend to player conversion rate is actually successful or not. I literally have no idea, but I think as a player, they're just sweet and they're fun to watch. And I like, I like looking at the scoreboards and seeing who's winning and being impressed at like, holy cap. Cause the other thing that I'll always say is when I look at the box box boot camp, especially for the, the high level players, I'm always like, wow, they played 200 games in 14 days. This is insane. Actually, it's usually more like 200 games in 10 days. I think it was uh, Dish Soap. It was either Dish Soap or Sepsico that was playing like 22 games a day. Some bonkers number. So. Uh, 
Uh, hey, Mort, could you please let us know what are the criteria that make a set successful or unsuccessful? So you're going to laugh, um, but there's a really simple answer here. It's a really simple answer, and it's just the, the sad truth of it. Player numbers. That's it. Are players playing the game? If a set is successful, there are a lot of players, and they're playing many games. The fancy term for that is player retention, but in a bad set, players play the game and then quit. In a good set, players play the game and keep playing the set. That's it. Good set, bad set. It's that simple. So, yeah. Um, that's what we look for as success. I thought it would be money. No. Mon money has nothing to do with gameplay. So, yeah, it's, it's really just how many people are playing the game. That's it. We have to make money to pay the bills. Don't get me wrong, but you could have a you could have a very good set that didn't make money because the cosmetics weren't appealing. You could have a very bad set that made a ton of money because the cosmetics were very appealing. So that would be weird. That would be weird to tie money to set success. That'd be really weird. No one buys chibis if no one is playing the game. Sure, sure, but. We've definitely had good sets make less money than less good sets because the cosmetics weren't as appealing. That's definitely a thing that can happen too. So. Da, 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 da. Uh, hey Mort, love everything the team puts out even when not perfect. Do you have any fallbacks if the three sets per year plan doesn't keep player numbers as before for some reason? Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I would say, I mean, like I said, you're already seeing some of that, right? You're seeing like the set revival, stuff like that. If, because from a development side, the three sets a year is great. It gives us a full year on sets. Life has been good. If for some reason we find that we need to invest in another player spike, we will. But that being said, I don't think there's anything, I don't know. It's, it's funny because the only inevitable thing I could see that would get the numbers... Because, okay. Let's say we made a set, okay? And the set launches at X numbers. No matter how good the set is, there is a natural decline downward, right? The question is, how bad is that natural decline? So let's say it's, it's declining downwards. Three months have passed. Time for a mid-set. No mid-set ever gets that number back up to X, Okay. A mid-set brings back some players, but never back up to X. And then, by the way, that was the end of that song. So now we're going to play this playlist. Okay. Um, no mid-set ever got the number back up to X. So it's like, start at X, down, 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 down. Mid-set, but not to X. Down, 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 down. New set. Um... No mid set has ever got it back to X. That's just impossible. Only full sets get you that, that big player spike. So if someone from insights or in charge was like, Hey, at three sets a year, we need a way to get our numbers back up to X or close to X before the next set. If a mid set can't do it, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that there's a lot of other things we could do. I mean, we can do the things we're planning, but then you start getting into really weird stuff where it's like, do you do four sets a year? But like, that that ain't happening. That ain't happening. So, I don't know. I, th I think the things that we're going to do are going to be enough. I'm not too worried about it. Uh, how do you feel anti-heal is performing? Sunfire and Morellas are the two items, and red buff. I am seeing certain champs' abilities apply it too, but against certain champs, it feels like anti-heal doesn't even influence them. How do you determine if the anti-heal should be improved or the healing should be toned back? Ah! So, fun fact, for those who don't remember and haven't been playing TFT for that long, we have done... This is where, again, historical knowledge can matter a lot. Anti-heal has been as high as 90% in TFT's life. And as low as it is now, which I believe is 30 or 33%. It's either 30 or 33. 
want to say 30. But for a while, it was 75. For a while, it was the tooltip said 50, but actually 75. So, yeah. Um, and what I'll say is what we mostly learned is that we didn't like the binary nature of if I'm supposed to heal for a thousand and you have 75% anti-heal, I just, my heal may as well do nothing. Um, so generally across the board, we've been lowering counters, right? Shred is down to like 30%, anti-heal's down to like 30%. Uh, you should not lose a fight based off a single, do I have anti-heal or not? So if somebody's heal is too strong, it's probably just because now the heal is too strong. But we do not think we should be buffing these countermeasures because they create this like binary swing where it's like, this fight my champion does nothing. Um, and even now at 30% shred and anti-heal, most challenger players will tell you they're like still almost 100% necessary. So... I would prefer anti-heal removed and healing reduced. Sure, but that's just removing parts of the game. Like, the more things we have in the game, it adds, like, the extra depth and stuff like that. Yes, we could just remove shred completely. We could remove anti-heal completely. But then we're just making a, like, less deep game. So. This is a good question. Would you value a competitive person, dish shop, etc., over non-ranked players' input? Is there different processes for each, or only one team sifts through the data? No. So, obviously, the source of the data matters, but my initial approach with any data is massive amounts of skepticism, right? It's just like, whether it be dish soap or random Twitch chatter or a thing, a player says a thing, and I'll listen to it, and I'll put it in the back of my head. What matters is volume, right? So it's like, if Dish Soap says a thing, and another competitive player says a thing, and a bunch of players are saying a thing, and I'm getting DMs about it, then it starts to be like, okay, we should really look into this. Um, because again, just because you're good at playing TFT does not mean you're good at problem analysis or things like that. So it's, it's definitely not like a competitive players get special treatment or anything like that. It's all just possible data sources. Everyone's got their biases. Challenger players in particular can be very biased towards the things they want the game to be, which are not necessarily good for all players. So it would be foolish to just listen to them blindly. Uh, okay, this is... A, I'm going to answer this question and it's going to sound arrogant. Uh, what's your main market competitors you track? What competitor game has an interesting design features? So what's your main market competitors you track? There aren't any. Um, TFT is kind of its own space. Um, we've said that we're the number one strategy game in the world, which we are. I can say that. I'm allowed to say that out loud. Um, but there aren't really any other competitors that are anywhere remotely close. So it's just kind of like, we're kind of doing our own thing. Um, and otherwise you end up with like general thing. This is, I hate people who do this thing where they're like, okay, you're a game with X million players and your competition is Fortnite. Fortnite. It's like, okay, those serve completely different audiences. There's no world where we're going to just be like, how do we beat Fortnite? Like, no, Fortnite's Fortnite. We just make our, we do our own game. So... I don't know. I don't, I don't know that we have any like main competitors. Um, but as far as other interesting design features, there are definitely like games we play where it's like, oh, that's a cool thing. This is why it's good to just play games in general. Roguelikes often have really cool game features that are interesting for design space, stuff like that. Um, so isn't poker more popular strategy game? Is poker a strategy game? Would you call poker a strategy game? And also, poker is not a video game. These, these weird, like, Twitch chatters who are like, ah, but what about poker? Like, they're not video games, man. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. We at Riot aren't really looking like, how do we beat poker? That'd, that'd be bad business analysis, man. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm trying to... 
get through. We're running out of time here. Uh, hey Mort, fellow game designer here. I love playing TFT, but I also enjoy analyzing it from a designer's perspective. I've picked apart some of its mechanics from a more technical standpoint. I love making damage graphs, checking how each item scales and works with each champion, and other mathematical shenanigans. Me too. That's fun. I think TFT has such a strong core that it's really easy to play with its variables and do tests. What are some of the other more traditional and less data-driven design concepts you think take that you take into account when thinking about the game? Ah, so okay, what you just described is the type of design I like. I'm the I'm the spreadsheet designer. I'm the math designer, right? But the other part that's important to the to the design of a TFT set that I'm not as good at, but a lot of the other team is, is the creativeness. It's the fantasy, right? It's the I want to make this champion because it's cool. I want to do this thing because it's fun. I want to run off the board and do sit-ups. I want to eat champions and spit them out into items. I want to, uh, you know, shoot a giant laser in five different ways with an EDM trait, right? It's it's the fantasy aspect that no amount of math makes you go, I'm going to have a champion shoot five lasers. Um, but that's really important because that's how a lot of people generally perceive your game is that fun stuff. So, and that's the part that the team has to really look at. It's like, because if, if I made every set, I think a lot of people would look at the set and go, it's very balanced and very boring. It's very boring. Um, so, and that's, that's the other side of the equation. But thankfully, we have a lot more people on the team that are good at that. So, yeah. Can you tell me if you have any idea about skipping level six and seven and trying to get to eight to finally play roulette? And will there be any additional settings for those looking to reduce visual effects for reasons of discomfort as well as faster mental exhaustion? Okay, this is one of those questions that like, it's hard to not read in between the lines here because they're trying to like be polite under the facade of kind of being an ass. And it's really unfortunate. Um, can you tell me if you have any idea about skipping level six and seven and trying to get to eight? So this is an example where we have a player who no matter what the outcome is, is going to complain, right? It's the level eight lottery. It's the level seven lottery. It's the level six lottery. Like no matter what point at the game an action is taken, this person is going to say the action is incorrect. If someone is fast aiding, that's apparently bad. But we also know when level 8 was hard to get to, it was the level 7 lottery. And we also know when people read to roll down at 6, it was the level 6 lottery, right? Like, any action just all of a sudden becomes negative for some reason. This is not a communication tactic. This is not helpful to discussion, right? And if you watch any actual player right now, there are some people who roll down on 7. There are some people who roll down on 8. There are different times based on different board states. We are pretty happy with the state it's in right now. So your assessment that we are trying to get people out of the level eight roulette is false, not useful, not helpful, and doesn't make you smart. Then you say, will there be an additional settings for those looking to reduce visual effects for reasons of discomfort, as well as faster mental exhaustion? This is again, uh, based on that Reddit thread about finishers and a jaded thing to show, I wanna turn off finishers is what they're basically asking here. And I'll give the same answer I did before, which is, A, it's not my department. I, I don't decide this stuff. Um, it's very clear there are a vocal group of players that really want to turn off finishers for whatever reason. There are some, some small number that have these legitimate complaints, especially with some of the newer ones that are a bit more flashy. And then there are some that are weaponizing those few and using that as their excuse for why they want it off. So, uh, you know, and nothing, nothing I could say would ever convince these people that finishers are good for the game. So I'm not really going to try to have that argument. So, but yeah, they, they, they clearly the people who do not like finishers really do not like finishers. And I hear you. So. Da, 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 da. Uh, 
Uh, sorry if you answered this already, but was Seraphine ever intended to be a five class? I personally predicted she was going to use her three ultimate form skins in some way, same way Sona does. Uh, so interesting you ask this. It's interesting you ask this because yes, actually, there was a time when Seraphine was a five cost. In a lot of the early versions of Witty's version of the set, Seraphine was the five cost of KDA. Uh, but Sona was also a five cost in the set. Uh, and I remember having the conversation distinctly with Witty where I was like, Sona and Seraphine both five costs in the same set? I don't think so. Uh, that was a question answered at Vegas. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, no. And of the two, which one are we going to keep? DJ Sona. DJ Sona is way cooler. So, so Seraphine got demoted. But yes, that was a thing. All right, mods, we're getting down to it. So if you have any really good questions, keep them. Otherwise, like, dismiss the rest. Uh, is the team happy with the lower amount of three-star champions in this set? Like, is almost none reroll comps this set, and the only three-star you see in-game are the chosen ones? I mean, I don't know that that's true. I think there are plenty of reroll comps. Yone, Ribbon, uh, Country, reroll, stuff like that. That being said, I think... As I look at the balance day of the game right now, I think there are a few one and two costs that need more love. Um, but overall, I would say yes. We are happy with the state of three stars, especially at four and five. Uh, so overall, pretty happy with that. Yeah. If anything, if anything, I could see some of the three star four costs just needing buffed for how rare they are now. But that's about it. Uh, what is your opinion on a <clears throat> four-cost headliner pivot? I, one, find it pretty difficult sometimes. For example, Disco, to sell my headliner and then hope to hit the four-cost headliner. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. This is one of those things where I'm saying that, like, right now it feels too necessary. It feels like you have to do a four-cost headliner pivot, and I'd like to see more options for reroll comps to be possible. An example here is, like, if you had a headliner Disco Gragas and we're able to hit the TF2, that should be enough, right? Like that should be an option. In order to make that true though, there has to be more power in the traits and less in the champions. So that's the big challenge. But I, I think, there, like I said, that's why it's not quite perfect, but it's nitpicky. Uh, hey Mort, I had commented during the charity stream that one of the big things I like in games is the idea of overlapping axes of randomness. Was curious how you feel about the current layers and different axes you have, and do you feel that you would prefer more axes to change the amount of variation that exists in the game? Ah, so this is an area that's really interesting because there are parts of our game that were always going to be inherently random, uh, and there are other parts of the game where there are randomness that probably don't need to be. Um... So, for example, one of the areas that's always going to have randomness is the shop, right? The shop is the shop. It's probably one of the more fundamental parts of TFT, and I doubt we're going to reduce the randomness in the shop. But there's another area, which is the item and orb distribution, where currently I would say there's probably too much variance. A really easy example players will bring up is uh, Tome Drops. Is it fair that you get two items and somebody else gets two items and a Tome? Is that fair? Is that really what we want? I don't know. So the, that's the other thing, though, is that there's a difference between random and variance. Um, I think there are healthy ways to add variance while keeping the game fair. And I think we've seen success with this with things like augments and portals, right? Portals make every game feel variant and different because there are different starts to the game while still being fair. And so I think our job is to find less axes of randomness and more axes of fair variance 
but more axes of fair variance that don't all just feel like portals. So that's going to be the trick. As a, as a dumb example, I, we wouldn't do this, but let's say if somebody got a tome during Krugs, everyone got a tome during Krugs. Sure, that'd be fair, but that's also just, that may as well be a portal, right? So that would be a bad example. Hey Mort, what should a one-on-one -on -one look like for a newer developer? I feel like I'm underutilizing this time with my manager, but unsure how to approach it. Ah, okay. So if you're a newer developer, uh, the way a one-on-one -on -one should be for you is this is your time to talk to somebody with more experience. You should be asking questions about the job, about anything. One of the things I see is that newer people feel like asking questions is a sign of weakness. It's not. It's a sign that you're you're trying to learn. So every one-on-one -on -one you have, you should just be like, "Hey, what do you do in this situation? How does this happen? What do you what do you do in you know about this? Learn from that person, and because your job is to sort of gain from their experience. They might not be smarter than you, but they've got more experience than you, and so you need to learn from their experience. What did you do when this happened? What did you do when this game was going wrong? What did you do when this thing, how did you handle this? Just ask questions. That's what your one-on-one -on -one should be. Learn from their experience. In school, you learn by answering questions. At work, you learn by asking questions. Yes, exactly, exactly. So just ask questions. And if they're a good mentor, they'll be happy to share all that knowledge with you. All right, I got a few more minutes if there's any more questions that want to come through. Hey Mort, how has the holiday season treated you? Good. We're in a we're in a weird state here with our family, so um it definitely wasn't one of the more Christmassy Christmases, but Trying to highlight something while it's scrolling. All right, some first-time chatter asked a last question. Let's read it together. Uh, hey, Mort, do you think randomness produced? Okay, hang on. Do you think randomness produced by design should have slightly less influence on the game? Don't get me wrong. I know TFT is fundamentally a somewhat luck-based game. I'm not talking about high rolling five costs or things like that. For example, in a disco game, spats being present on carousel is directly bad for the disco player and it feels extra bad when dropped a spat, especially since there's very little you can even try to play around it besides a scuffed pivot. Uh, sure. Depends on when the spatula drops though, but are you telling me there's nothing you can use the spatula? If so, that feels like something we need to solve on the end of spatulas. But I don't know, like, that's also a question of like, did you get the spatula? Why are you playing disco? Shouldn't you then consider options to use that because like everything is a piece of a resource you should be considering how to use those resources versus saying i'm a disco player therefore everything must fall into my lap so again tft is at its best when you uh are learning how to play around those resources and opening up paths i also think being afraid of a dead spat is okay so Okay, cool. There were a bunch of questions and then they all disappeared. Okay, well, I think we're hitting about the four hour mark here. So, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Felt like the questions were relatively easy this time. Nothing too spicy. It felt, un it felt not spicy. That's okay. Cool. Um, I will be back, I believe, tomorrow? Is tomorrow when I'm planned? You suck better? Okay, thank you. Is tomorrow when I'm back, mods? Yeah? Okay. So tomorrow I'm back, but it will be a weird stream. If you only watch me for TFT, don't show up tomorrow. Um, tomorrow I will be streaming my favorite game of all time, Chrono Trigger. We're going to marathon through Chrono Trigger. 
my last playtime was at 17 hours when I beat it, so our goal is to get through the game in two days. So, should be fun. Yeah. Alright, that's going to do it for me. I will see you all tomorrow. Otherwise, if not, I'll see you a weekend for the normal TFT stream. So, okay. Bye, friends.